Uh, good morning. I'm Corey Johnson, uh, Speaker of the New York City Council, and I want to thank uh, you all for being here today. I want to start by thanking uh, Council Members Mark Levine and Carlina Rivera for holding this important hearing. Healthcare is an existential issue. It is a life or death issue. It is a make or break financial issue, and it is a peace of mind issue. It is easier than ever to access health care from the Affordable Care Act to NYC Care. We have made a lot of meaningful progress in getting more people enrolled in health insurance, but it's not good enough. And while we probably need federal intervention to truly solve our health care problems as a city, we could be doing a much better job. Every New Yorker deserves access to health care that they will actually use. Too many people have been left behind without coverage or without access to culturally and linguistically competent health care, without access to care in their neighborhoods. And for me, this is a deeply personal issue. I lost my job shortly after I was diagnosed as HIV positive when I was 22 years old in 2004, which meant that when I lost my job, I lost my health insurance right after getting an HIV diagnosis. It is one of the toughest things that I've ever gone through, but the first place that I went to after I seroconverted and lost my health insurance was Aperture, which is one of the top LGBT-affirming, minority-focused community health centers in New York City, and it was the staff there that got me enrolled in ADAP, the AIDS Drugs Assistance Program, and connected me to care that was right for me. I know the difference that great health care can make, and that is why I am proudly sponsoring Introduction 1668 with Council Members Levine and Rivera. It will create a health access program that goes beyond the H&H &H system and connects anyone who participates in a coordinated, personalized care in their communities. NYC Care relies just on H&H &H facilities, so it can't reach all of New York City's most vulnerable districts. For example, Queens Community District 7, which is Flushing, uh, Murray Hill, and Whitestone has the highest uninsured rate in the entire city at 5.5%, and it doesn't have a single public hospital facility. <clears throat> uh, Brooklyn Community District 7, which is Sunset Park and Windsor Terrace, has an uninsured rate of 12.4% and no public hospital facilities nearby. Staten Island doesn't have an H&H &H acute care facility providing specialty services. How can we say we are adequately serving all New Yorkers when some need to travel far from home to access care? But there is a simple solution here. The city is filled with local providers offering excellent care. They're called federally qualified health centers, FQHCs. You'll hear a lot about them today. New York's 500 FQHC sites serve 1.3 million patients, including 370,000 in a language other than English. The health access program created by Introduction 1668 will include not just the H&H &H system, but FQHCs. This would help not just those who are uninsured, but every New Yorker looking for help in navigating the healthcare system. To achieve, to achieve true access, we have to connect New Yorkers to healthcare sites across the city where they live. You need to be able to go to a hospital in your borough or get primary care in your neighborhood. If you struggled with coverage, you should not have to go to an H&H &H facility that's nowhere near your home just to get care on a sliding scale. And we shouldn't be drawing patients away from local providers that speak their language and offer diverse tailored services. And because so many New Yorkers without, with insurance need a little help in figuring out how to use it, participants will also have access to telemedicine services and a patient navigator to help them coordinate primary care and specialty care, access medication, and hopefully minimize costs. If you're a 25-year-old freelancer with insurance you bought on the exchange, it can be daunting to figure out what kind of coverage you have, how to find specialists, how to make sure your medical records are shared, and how to get prescriptions at the lowest cost. This takes the guesswork and confusion out of that process. You'll have someone that will help you through all of that at no extra cost. We have all the tools we need to make New York a healthier, fairer city, 
I hope this hearing is the beginning of that conversation on how we can work together. And before I turn it over to uh, Chair Levine, I just wanna say uh, I'm happy to have the team come up that's gonna uh, testify on this from the administration, from h and I, I, I just wanna start out this hearing, uh, and I think uh, Chair Rivera and Chair Levine would agree with me on this. Uh, we are so lucky to have Dr. Mitchell Katz uh, leading h and in New York, he is, uh, has done an incredible job in a short amount of time in taking a really precarious financial situation that the system was in and turning it around without compromising quality services and patient care in the system. Uh, we have the greatest public hospital system in the world. Uh, when the President of the United States is in New York, if something bad happens, they are slated to go to Bellevue, which shows how great our system is. And Dr. Katz, uh, I think you've just done an amazing job uh, under really difficult uh, federal conditions in stabilizing the system and continuing to bring in revenue in uh, getting care out there to communities that need it. And so uh, we are really grateful for your leadership, for your service, but we think we need to go deeper. We think we need to go even farther than H&H, &H, and that is what this hearing is going to be about today. And so with that, I turn it over to Chair Levine. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you uh, so much, Mr. Speaker. I'm trying to resist unkind thoughts about the president falling sick in New York City. <laughs> Not going to go there. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Mark Levine, Chair of the City Council's Health Committee. I am pleased that we are joined today by fellow council members Diana Ayala, Dr. Matthew Eugene, and council member Bob Holden. Um, I too uh, am thrilled today that we'll be hearing from the leadership team of Health and Hospitals and, and Dr. Katz, I consider you the best public hospital leader in America. Um, we're so grateful for your leadership here. Um, I'm also thrilled that we're joined today by leaders of the workers who make our healthcare system work, including NISNA and 1199. Thank you. Um, we, we are here today to discuss universal health access in New York City. True universal access, available to all, regardless of where they live, regardless of what neighborhood they are in, regardless of their ability to pay, and yes, regardless of their immigration status. Sadly, we have not yet fulfilled that promise for hundreds of thousands of our fellow New Yorkers, people who often, because they are undocumented, don't qualify for public health insurance and get no medical care until they are in crisis and land in the emergency room, a situation which is bad for patients, which puts the broader public health of our city at risk, and which imposes an extraordinary financial burden on our public hospitals. This is unacceptable. We need a system that gives primary access to everyone with services in the neighborhoods where they live, in the languages that they speak, on a sliding fee scale that they can afford. And the only way we can achieve this citywide, comprehensively, at the scale we need is by building on our phenomenal network of 500 community-based health centers, also known as FQHCs. These are the health providers that are on the ground, in communities, building trust and relationships and cultural sensitivity. And it would be crazy to cut them out of a program that has, as one of its primary goals, allowing undocumented immigrants to feel comfortable accessing primary health care. Now, our public hospitals are a true treasure, but they simply can't do this alone. And that's why today we're conducting this hearing on an important piece of legislation, Intro 1668, to ensure that participants in the city's NYC care program have the chance to access primary care, not just at H&H &H facilities, but at community-based health centers in every neighborhood in the city, with primary care physicians and practitioners to help direct develop and coordinate their treatment, testing, and other services, with the comprehensive program of patient navigators, with telemedicine service available 24-7, with seamless integration to specialists in the h, &H system. This is how we will truly achieve healthcare for all in this city. Lastly, I wanna mention that if you care about health policy in this town, and if you're here today, I know you do, 
then you should be incredibly thankful that you have the most phenomenal team staffing the City Council's Health Committee. In Sara Liss, Zay Emanuel Hailu, Emily Barkun, Laura Hunt, and Lewis Cholden Brown. Can you all give us the big. Uh, and also, I want to acknowledge the incredible work that my committee, my staff members have done Aya Keefe, Amy Slattery, and Winthrop Roosevelt. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to my partner in all things health and co chair of this hearing, Carlina Rivera. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good morning. That's great, it's awesome. So good morning, everyone. I am Council Member Carlina Rivera, Chair of the Hospitals Committee, and I also want to recognize members of my committee, Council Members Eugene and Ayala. Health and Hospitals remains the largest provider of health care to New Yorkers who are uninsured, and they remain committed to providing care to all individuals, regardless of their ability to pay. Earlier this year, h and &H launched the NYC Care Program, a healthcare access program that guarantees low cost and no cost services to New Yorkers who do not qualify for or cannot afford health insurance provided through h and &H. In addition to all of the services h and &H has always provided to the uninsured community, those who are enrolled in NYC Care receive a membership card, can choose a primary care provider, and are given access to customer service representatives for assistance accessing care. Accessing. Those who are uninsured yet eligible for health insurance will receive assistance enrolling in insurance in an effort to lower the number of visits to H&H &H by uninsured yet insurable patients. NYC Care promotes the use of primary and preventative care, which will help enrollees avoid unnecessary emergency room visits and promote better health outcomes and access. Currently, NYC Care is operating in the South Bronx with plans to expand to Brooklyn and Staten Island. And by 2021, the program plans to be located in all five boroughs. I am proud that our city is focusing on supporting our immigrant communities, a necessary endeavor, while the federal administration continues their relentless and xenophobic attacks on some of our city's most vulnerable. There are an estimated 560,000 undocumented individuals in the city and only 42%, about 235,000, are insured, leaving 324,800 without health insurance. This number is expected to rise due to the United States Department of Homeland Security's DHS intention to alter the definition of public charge, which would discourage immigrants and their families from accepting public benefits, including public health insurance. We clearly need to ensure that all of our health programs geared towards uninsured individuals, including those who are undocumented, are operating well, providing meaningful care, and are efficient. I am hoping to learn more about the rollout of NYC Care in the Bronx today. Specifically, I want to know that we have reached as many people as possible. We must examine outreach efforts, who the remaining uninsured are, and what more we can do as a city. I want to hear today how the program is adding, is aiding those in the South Bronx and about the services participants in NYC Care are taking advantage of. As fellow co-sponsor of intro number 1668, I believe that we need a more robust program in place, one that reaches every community district and includes more providers. Yet we should also make sure that the programs currently in place are effective as possible. I am also a proud co-sponsor of Reso number 918, calling on the state of New York to pass and the governor to sign S3900-85974, an act to amend the social services law in relation to coverage for health care services under the basic health program for individuals whose immigration status renders him or her ineligible for federal financial participation. Okay. The Affordable Care Act directs the Secretary of Health and Human Services to establish a basic health program that provides an option for states to offer particular health coverage. New York State's basic health program is known as the Essential Plan. The, the bills in Albany, sponsored by State Senator Rivera and Assembly Member Gottfried, would provide adult immigrants with access to health insurance coverage that is equivalent to the coverage offered to their citizen or lawfully present counterparts. By providing health care to all individuals, regardless of immigration status, the bill would improve public health and access to health care, as previously discussed. 
I will now read a statement by its prime sponsor, Councilmember Adams, about this resolution. Councilmember Adams could not join us today, but I want to make sure that we get her statement on the record as we are in full support of making sure that we pass this law and we support every single New Yorker to receive quality health care. So thank you for this important hearing today on universal, on universal health care access. Although the state and city of New York are ahead of many other states in providing health care access, we have not done enough to ensure our undocumented immigrant population is insured. I represent District 28 in southeastern Queens, a neighborhood with a large immigrant population, many of whom are uninsured. Because of this, I've introduced Resolution 918, which calls on the state of New York to pass bill sponsored by Senator Gustavo Rivera and Assemblymember Richard Goffrey to expand health care coverage services under the essential plan program to all qualifying New Yorkers, regardless of their immigration status. Currently, New York State's essential plan program receives a large portion of its funding from the federal government. Because of this, our undocumented population is completely left out of the program and far too often left out in the cold without any insurance at all. The state bill, which my resolution supports, would solve this issue by building upon the current essential plan structure and create a state-funded essential plan for all New Yorkers. According to the Mayor's Office of Immigration Affairs, there are an estimated 560,000 undocumented individuals in New York City and over half of them are living without any health insurance. The lack of coverage has a, high, a higher impact on undocumented women. Since undocumented women of low and moderate income are excluded from the essential plan, they face major financial barriers in situations where reproductive health services are needed. The need for health care should not be dependent on a woman's immigration status. With so many states restricting vital health and reproductive services, our city should be expanding access, not restricting it. We need to do better by the undocumented population in our city. Furthermore, we need to do better by all women in our city. Undocumented women are among our most vulnerable population. Resolution 918 will make life a little bit easier for them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair Rivera. Uh, I want to acknowledge we have been joined by fellow Health Committee member Andy Cohen, and I want to call up uh, our first panel, um, led by Dr. Mitchell Katz and other executives at H and H, including Marielle Kress, Ted Long, Dr. Ted Long, and Rishi, Rishi Sood. And I would like to ask. Uh, our committee council, uh, Sarlis, uh, when, when our panel is ready uh, to administer the affirmation. And anyone who plans to testify or answer questions, please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Uh, Mitch, turn your mic on. Uh, Chairperson Levine, Chairperson Rivera, and committee members, it's, it's just about two years since I returned home, uh, and it's been so great, um, largely because with all the horrible rhetoric of the federal government, it's so nice to be in a place where the government is actually responsive, thoughtful, inclusive, and trying to do the right thing, and I can't, I can't imagine a better time to be in New York. So thank you for all that you do uh, for us, uh, the health and hospital system, and for the entire city. I appreciate this opportunity uh, to update you on the implementation of NYC CARE. Uh, I have practiced medicine for 30 years in public systems across the country, and those systems are fragile. Um, Washington, D.C. used to have a public hospital, no more. Boston used to have a public hospital, no more. Philadelphia used to have a public hospital, no more. Milwaukee used to have a public hospital, no more. Um, because they didn't have city councils like you and mayors like Bill uh, de Blasio and people who really cared about making sure that there was access through a public system. Uh, we currently take care of over a million patients each year. Uh, ultimately, though, and I think uh, Chairperson Rivera spoke to it very well. We need a system, a single-payer system that guarantees care to everyone and guarantees that the money goes to the care of the people, that the money doesn't go to insurance 
um, programs that spend money on administration and denying people care and reviewing the care that the, that the primary care doctor has already approved. And so I hope that someday soon we're going to see uh, in New York and maybe someday even in our country a single payer system. Um, I was proud in January uh, to join the mayor in announcing the launch of the largest, most comprehensive initiative in the nation to guarantee health care for every New Yorker. Uh, no one should live in fear. Um, I, I particularly resonate with the speaker's story about what it, would, what it must have been like, how brave he was you know, at such a young age to find himself without any insurance and have to circumvent our system. That happens all the time in New York still with people who are new to our country. Uh, we run a phenomenal system in health and hospitals, but how would you know if you just came to our country? How would you know where to go? Who would tell you? How could you find your way? Um, so there, there is so much more um, that we can do together. Um, through New York City's guaranteed commitment, we're increasing enrollment in the city's public option, Metro Plus, uh, for insurance coverage on the health exchange and enrolling those who do not qualify uh, for uh, or cannot afford health insurance to New York City Care, which will be available across the five boroughs by the end of 2020. Um, it builds on the initiatives that I previously worked on, Healthy San Francisco and My Health in LA. While, while I'm very proud of those programs, I have to say that New York City Care is a much broader set of services. Um, and in that sense, um, really, I think, exceeds the other programs. And certainly when it's fully implemented, it will exceed it as well in numbers. Uh, we had a very successful uh, Bronx launch. Uh, I'm very uh, proud that uh, our hospital and clinic uh, representatives uh, are here um, because they did phenomenal work. Uh, we are on track to hit for the Bronx 10,000 patients in the first six months. Uh, and we have actually now hit, we're at 7,500 people have been enrolled in the first three months. Uh, so we're officially updating our account. We were at 5,000 at two months, 7,500 at three months. Um, we have enrolled people from every zip code in the Bronx. Uh, and we have also uh, kept our commitment um, that we would see every patient um, who enrolls would get an appointment with a primary care provider within two weeks, um, which is a standard that the community doesn't meet for privately insured patients, for any of you who've tried to get an appointment with, your, with a primary care doctor. But we realize that our patients have special challenges, and so when they need care, we want to be able to deliver that. Uh, we have provided 3,000 prescriptions after hours in the program. So health and hospitals always provided free and low cost prescriptions, but that sometimes meant if someone went to an emergency room on Friday, they had to wait until Monday to get the prescription. I find that unacceptable. Uh, and, and bad business as well as bad medicine, right? If someone comes on a Friday um, and they have shortness of breath due to asthma, and they can't get the air inhaler till Monday, they're gonna be back in the emergency room on Saturday. So um, the fact that we've been able to do those after hour uh, prescriptions, I think means a lot. Um, we do within NYC Care, comprehensive primary care and specialty care services at all our hospitals, including our Gotham Federally Qualified Health Center, uh, it's all based on sliding scale fee, based on income, household size. There are no membership fees. Uh, there are no monthly fees. Um, and besides the uh, affordable prescriptions uh, and extended hours, uh, we have a hotline that connects people um, to the care. And again, this is like a real, real people. This is not like leave a message and pray that somebody will call you back. Um, this is real people in a call center with multilingual uh, capabilities. Uh, I want to thank uh, our work uh, with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs and the Mayor's Fund to Advance New York. Uh, we have contracted with five community-based organizations. We have provided grants of 
a total of $650,000 to Emerald Island Isle Immigration Center, Bronx Works, Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy uh, Coalition, Mekong, New York City, and Sauti Yetu Center for African Women to hire 15 full-time staff members who refer uninsured New Yorkers in the Bronx for insurance screening and enrollment um, in NYC care in a culturally appropriate and sensitive manner. We've launched a multilingual and multi-platform public awareness campaign to promote New York City care launch in the Bronx. Uh, we were able to get pro bono support for the development of the posters, and I hope you've seen them and, and like how well it captures visually the ethnic diversity of New York. Um, and uh, we also have paid advertisement for placing those ads. Uh, as the program rolls out, we intend to replicate this and to work with community groups and ethnic media to reach every community in every borough. Uh, we have been working closely with the non-health and hospitals FQHCs. Uh, I love federally qualified health centers. I entirely agree with the speaker that they uh, provide um, incredible care in New York City and across this country and fill a, a very valuable gap. Uh, one of our, uh, the issues with federally qualified health centers is that they need great specialty care connections because under the legislation that governs federally qualified health centers, it's primary care. I'm a primary care doctor, I love primary care, but sometimes the woman has a lump in the breast and she needs specialty care. She needs a biopsy on their CT guidance. Uh, someone has, uh, uh, develops bleeding, they need to be seen by a gastroenterologist, those kinds of services that are not part of the spectrum of federally qualified health centers. So we've been working very closely with our partners uh, to be sure that when their patients need specialty care, we're providing it uh, quickly for their patients, we're providing it uh, with information back to them. We refer them back to their original sites so that uh, clinics do not lose patients and patients do not lose their clinics. Uh, we've also been working hard with the federally qualified health centers to be sure that the scripts at the call centers help patients to recognize that if their current care is at a federally qualified health center, that's great. Um, we fully support that, and they can join NYC Care in order to get their specialty care, um, but that we reinforce um, their staying with their federally qualified health center. Uh, so in conclusion, I've been very excited about the progress. I think 7,500 people in three months in every borough with a visit within every, with two weeks, 3,000 prescriptions after hours. To me, that's a good three months of work. But there's a lot more to do, right? That's just the beginning. Um, and I look forward to working with all of you on the spill on a vision that includes guaranteed health care for every New Yorker. Uh, thank you, and I'm here as well as Mario Kress, who's the executive director, uh, to answer any questions um, that we can, along with our, our colleagues from public health and Dr. Ted Long, our uh, head of primary care. I uh, thank you, Dr. Katz. I want to start again by thanking you for being here. As we said before, we feel uh, really lucky that our city has you. And since I was health committee chair uh, in the last session of the council, I was following your previous work in San Francisco and Los Angeles. What you have done for municipal health care is remarkable. And I look forward to continuing to work together to deepen that and strengthen that. And because of that fantastic experience, I want to start by asking you uh, what you think makes a healthcare system successful. So I want to ask, what are the driving forces that make people actually access care? Is it cost? Is it convenience? Uh, is it their relationship with their providers? Is it cultural competence? Is it whether their provider speaks their language? What are the driving factors that people uh, use to access care? I think the strongest is certainly relationship. Um, with their provider, and relationship encompasses all of the other things that you mentioned. Um, I, there's a very strong body of work that when people are seen by doctors and nurses who look like them, they're more satisfied with their care and they feel more connected. 
That being said, good providers, especially in a city like New York City, learn how to work well with a diverse population. But you, it's always better um, for people to get services where other people speak their language, other people are from their backgrounds, other people understand their life experience. You know, health and hospitals' uh, success as a safety net provider is unparalleled. It's actually, I think, impossible to measure how much it's meant to New York City since its creation. But its physical reach is limited because of, uh, it, you don't have a facility everywhere. It's impossible to. There are only so many facilities that you currently control. Do you think that people are more likely to access care if it is close by to where they live in their community? Yes, I think the data is very strong. Uh, I think, I mean, the, the only caveat I put is that, that, that that's for primary care. For primary which care. Which is to say, because uh, it becomes impossible to provide high quality specialty care in small areas, because usually specialty care requires uh, diagnostic equipment and other things that just can't be replicated. So even our 11 hospitals, we're working toward a vision where every hospital is meeting its community need, but every hospital doesn't do everything. Just because we can't get the, the critical mass of enough doctors, enough equipment in every place. But primary care should be uh, as close to where people live and work as possible. But for specialty care, if you were someone who lived in Brownsville, it would be better to actually have the specialty care at least be in your borough. Correct. Rather than going to absolutely. Manhattan for that specialty yes. care. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and with the transformative work that you've been doing at h, &H um, I, I want to uh, ask you about what you think people's perceptions and historic issues uh, with H and H, would it make some less likely to seek care there? Would people be less likely to seek care at H and H? I think there are there is some problematic history of H and H. I think the quality of the medical, nursing, pharmacy, social work care was always great. I think what wasn't great is customer service. And so I think that some people may have had the experience of calling and no one answered or calling and being told that there wasn't an appointment for months and months. Uh, one, one small example that, that uh, fits Cheriveras district is somebody might have called a gouverneur uh, for a primary care appointment and been told there's no appointment for six months. And because we weren't, we had no infrastructure, nobody said, oh, but by the way, we have a phenomenal doctor at Judson. Um, and we actually have appointments there. But there, because everything operated as its own thing, instead someone would be put on a wait list for six months. So n the system wasn't functioning as a system. And I think that that's the area of greatest growth. So I, what I want, I think if you talk, for certainly what I've learned in talking to New Yorkers about their view of health and hospitals, everyone's very clear. Something bad happens, I want to go to Bellevue, I want to go to Elmhurst, I want to go to Kings County. Right, they know that through the ED they're going to get great care, but can I get an appointment for a pap smear? Right, what, what, right. You know, can I can I use my telephone? You know, to just book myself for a pap smear. That's the area where health and hospitals still has quite a lot of work to do. Can you talk about Healthy San Francisco and the My Health LA program? You mentioned it in your uh, opening statement. What are lessons from those programs that you all applied in creating NYC Care? Uh, well, the the biggest lesson on from them, which we apl applied, was that you have to build on the existing structures um, that you have locally. Because if you just say, well, I want to create something new, um, then you're paying for everything, hospitalization, emergency room, primary care. So instead, what all three programs said is, okay, here's what we have. How do we make it a lot better? Uh, how do we tie it together? How do we do the system stuff? I think San Francisco had the advantage of having an employer spending mandate. It was pre-ACA, um, so they didn't, we didn't, have the same requirements of that the ACA imposed about what insurance should look like, and that provided a large influx of dollars. 
um, and we were able to direct most of those dollars to the federally qualified health centers. So that was an advantage that we had in San Francisco. In LA, which the program was larger, hit 130,000, while San Francisco maxed at about 75,000, now is under 15,000. In Los Angeles, it was somewhat different because they didn't have a group like all of you, and so Los Angeles, in a tough budget moment, basically eliminated half of its primary care. It just closed it. And so there was, and in that same vein, basically said, we can't do it. And so they gave, a, they closed about half the primary care and gave the dollars that were supporting that, they gave half of it to federally qualified health centers and other community clinics. Historically, this was maybe like 15 years ago. And so when I did LA uh, and uh, the program there, there was already a large pot of money that was supporting the federally qualified health centers because the county had sort of given up that as a mission. Uh, and so that program was about taking the dollars that were going to the federally qualified health centers already and other community clinics and turning it into a, a comprehensive care system. It had been previously, those dollars were used each visit a center got paid for, but there was no impanelment, there was no, this was your doctor. And so we took the dollars and we turned it into, uh, if you're going to this center, this is your place. Um, and again, like a primary care doctor, that's how I think. I want, want everybody to know where to go and other things to emanate from that. So, so FQHCs were integral to those it, two programs? They were, they were to both. So how come federally qualified health centers are not part of NYC Care? Well, again, first, I do believe they're part of uh, NYC Care because we, we are providing their specialty care and because we, we've included in the scripts uh, to have people recognize that their center is a good place to go to care. I think compared to LA, the biggest difference is that there was no primary care. The, the, I didn't have anything to build on in the public sector uh, because the public sector in, in its budget crisis had given up primary care. And so I already had a large set of dollars. It was not a new set, I would say. So I, didn't, I did not provide new dollars. I took the existing dollars that were going to them and I changed it into a guaranteed access program as opposed to a fee for service, um, you go here. So, you know, I'm happy to, you know, work with, with all of you on sort of as, as this mo moves forward, you know, how, how, how we include federally qualified health centers. Um, we love them, we want them to be part of this. Um, I think there's lots of room that we can do great stuff together. And I we think want them to be part of this too. Yeah, and I think why it's we're important to note that Bill. Gotham Health is the largest federally qualified health center network in the country too, which is part of our system. So. Um, absolutely, uh, federally qualified health centers are included in NYC care and, and health and hospitals as well. Um, I mean, the, you, know, I'm just, you don't have to respond to this, but I'm just sort of making to make a statement. The mayor has been going around saying he's providing universal health care access. And I think the reason why you're seeing this bill from, I mean, Chair Levine can speak to this, but the reason why you're seeing this bill from the city council is that we don't think this is universal uh, access. We're happy, we think it's great. We're glad this was talked about in the state of the city earlier this year. Uh, we're supportive of getting more people access to healthcare, but to call it universal healthcare access, but to leave out what this bill seeks to fill the gap on, I think shows that it's not universal healthcare access, which is why we're having this hearing today, which is why we support this bill. Chair Levine can go into that a little bit further. I wanna ask, what do you see as the future of healthcare in New York City? We're seeing lots of people who are eligible for insurance, but can't afford deductibles or co-pays, and there are plenty of folks that just can't figure out how to navigate their plans. So what do we need to do next to improve the odds that people actually get good care in terms of affordability, purchasing power, accessibility, not just from H&H, &H, but regardless of where they go? Well, thanks, Speaker. It gives me a second and for all of us to think about it. Uh, one of the great things about the clinic I work in at Gouverneur is a third of my patients 
are undocumented have no insurance. A third of them have Medicaid or Medicare, and a third of them have private insurance. And I can't tell you how extensive the problems are with people of private insurance. Um, in the case of one, one senior I took care of, he went to the emergency room, got, got an inhaler treatment, and had a $60 copay. And so what did he do? He didn't fill the prescription. And when I saw him several days later, he's more short of breath than he started, and he's insured. Right, so right, not the group, right, we, I mean, we're here because of your, how caring the city council is to focus on people who don't have, what we would say, don't have access, they're uninsured. This is a guy, he's, in, he's fully insured, he actually, for his emergency room visit, he would have paid zero. But what good is it if, he, if the medicine costs $60 and he doesn't have $60 and many people don't have $60? Um, and so ultimately, for the sake of New York, there really does need to be a major change. And I, I think the, the single-payer legislation um, that is, uh, uh, that uh, Chairperson Rivera talked about that is being considered at the state is the best option, ultimately. Uh, how much is the cost of NYC care? Okay, so, uh, let me try to answer that in a simple way given the complications. So we, if you conceptualize the cost of NYC care as the things we added, right, so, because remember the 7,500 people are getting all kinds of services that we always provided. So what have we added? So I told you we added 650,000 went to the community-based organizations. Um, and then we have hired additional doctors. We have hired uh, people who support those doctors along with nurse practitioners. We have expanded the pharmacy hours for the 3,000 prescriptions. We have expanded the hours of the call center. Um, and we have, while the, the ad campaign was created pro bono, we have purchased uh, ads in the, in the subways, bus shelters, and are doing media things. So th those are the additional things. Those are the things for which the $100 million is meant to pay for as we roll out. Uh, my colleagues at OMB are working on providing a figure on what those costs are, and th they are not yet there in terms of providing detailed information. So I, I do not mean this in any way to denigrate uh, uh, you, your leadership, H&H, &H, the, the, the program, but uh, not to try to boil it down too simply. But so outreach, pharmacy hours, a call center, and hiring equals guaranteed health care? Well, the, the idea of the guarantee, right, because obviously the amount we've spent so far only reflects what we've spent in the Bronx. I mean, it's not, it, the idea was to grow into universal because we saw as integral to this program this commitment that you get an appointment in two weeks. I don't, what I don't want this to be, and we didn't have this in San Francisco or LA, I don't want waiting lists. I don't want, you need care and you're on the waiting list in six months. So in order to prevent waiting lists and to keep the two-week commitment, it has to grow in each borough. And that's why we, we went first Bronx, next Brooklyn, Staten Island, and then we'll do Queens and, and Manhattan. And so in each area, that's how we grow. So at some point, it, the expense will, I, I think, be near 100 million. It certainly isn't there now. It will be 100 million of new dollars. Of new dollars. Of new dollars. And, and is that dollar, uh, is the 100 million money that OMB is giving to H&H, &H, or H&H &H is supposed to come up with revenue or internal budget dollars that will be dedicated to NYC care? No, that was OMB allocated $100 million to the program. OMB allocated $100 million. Okay. When you joined uh, just about two years ago to lead H&H, &H, uh, if you could just remind us all, what was the financial position that H&H &H was in? So uh, the uh, $1.8 billion deficit. $1.8 billion. That's it? That's it. $1.8 billion, and there were uh, significant dish cuts on the horizon. Correct. That got put off. 
Correct. Because of federal intervention. Correct. From basically Congress helped make that happen. Correct. Uh, and so where are we today? Right. So uh, the first push off took it from 1.8 to 1.5. Uh, and then the things that we've been doing to decrease administrative expenses and to increase revenue uh, have gotten us about two-thirds of the, of the budget hole is closed now. So we have about a third, but we're, we're on track to close the whole thing. I mean, you remember that um, my strategy and, and Chair Rivera um, was very good at, at both helping me and helping people to understand was always, it's a multi-year plan from my point of view, there is no more deficit. What I mean by that is we, we, we have a plan that eliminates it. Uh, and so far, we're on track. We're actually a little ahead of where we thought we would be. So the, the idea is as you get better at, at revenue, and I want to be clear, it's revenue from insurance companies. It's not billing people. We're not interested. People we take care of do not have dollars to pay for health care. But health and hospitals, for a complicated set of reasons was not good at billing insurance. We were basically giving insurance companies a free ride. Uh, they were gaining the insurance premiums and we were providing care for free. It was a great deal for them, um, not such a great deal for the city. Um, so uh, if we continue to hit our, our milestones, we will eliminate the deficit by about year four. When, when is year four? Two years, Two years from, from now. now. Yeah. Two years from now, and then when do we start to see surpluses? Uh, well, I would assume that, that we would always spend whatever money we had on our patients. I don't know. I've never worked for a group with a surplus. Uh, got it. Okay, I have some questions. Thank you, Dr. Gatz. I have some questions for DOHMH, if they would like to come up. And I'll try to get through this quickly because um, I want to move to the other chairs. But uh, I want to start by uh, talking about some of the work the administration has done on health access prior to NYC Care. Let's start with the 2015 Immigrant Health Care Task Force, which was created with the goal of increasing access to health care services among immigrant populations that identified major barriers to health care access, including inadequate cultural and linguistic competency among providers and limited provider capacity. That task force said the best way to address these barriers was to create a direct access health care program. A year later, the administration launched a one-year pilot called Action Health NYC for low-income residents who were uninsured and not eligible for health insurance. Those in the pilot had care coordinators and used both FQHCs, they used both FQHCs and H&H &H facilities to get primary care. After the pilot ended, the council received an evaluation, but it didn't include any recommendations, which is really bizarre. There was no assessment of scalability, nothing on the extent of need or revised costs. Why did the city council not get any of these recommendations? Uh, thank you, Speaker, for that question. And uh, the Action Health Demonstration Program, as you mentioned, was a year-long demonstration program which was meant uh, to have a robust independent evaluation. So the Department of Health, along with our partners at Health and Hospitals, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, and other city agencies, contracted out the evaluation to a third party. Uh, that report that was made available to the Council, as well as uh, all our other partners, uh, was meant to be an independent evaluation that showed whether or not uh, certain aspects of Action Health worked. So uh, after that report was, uh, was finished and made public, uh, health and hospitals used it to inform the development of NYC care. Were there recommendations? In the actual evaluation from the American Institutes for Research, there were, um, there were any recommendations came directly from the American Institutes of Research. The task force had ended at that point. Uh, do you think that it was a thorough evaluation? Yes. But I'm confused. If, if there were insurmountable challenges, why weren't they mentioned in the evaluation? So the evaluation was very specific to elements of Action Health that were being evaluated uh, and the program at those primary care homes that you mentioned. Why wasn't the pilot extended? So Action Health was meant to be a year-long demonstration where we were looking for learnings to inform the administration's strategy on what uninsured access to care would look like. 
uh, why were FUQHCs included at the time? Uh, as Dr. Katz mentioned, a key part of NYC Care as well as Action Health is building on the primary care home model and that relationship uh, with health professionals or with your primary care provider. And so what we did when act in Action Health was we included community uh, partners, including FQHCs, that uh, based on where the Action Health model was rolled out. In that case, it was in two neighborhoods in Queens. But let's be clear, that's not what NYC Care is doing. And what, and what the action so, model did. So I you know, defer to my colleagues at Health and Hospitals on the specifics of NYC Care, but NYC Care is building on the learnings from Action Health, which includes uh, the fact that there was a primary care home model included. Did anything about the pilot contribute to the decision not to include FQHCs in NYC Care? So I defer to Dr. Katz on, on questions about NYC care. No. Uh, the pilot ended in June of 2017 and NYC care wasn't launched mm -hmm. until the summer of 2019. That's a pretty big gap. Why is that? So throughout that time at the health department, we were certainly having conversations with our partners across the administration on uh, what the best strategy was to improve access to health care for immigrant and other populations. You worked on the task force. I did. So the recommendations of the task force were pretty clear, that a direct access program is the best way to address barriers in getting good care. Is the administration disavowing those findings now? Uh, I don't believe the administration is disavowing those fi findings. NYC Care is a program that uh, builds on learnings from Action Health and the recommendations from the 2014-2015 task force. Did you or anyone at DOHMH make any recommendations to City Hall about how a health a uh, how a health access program should work before they rolled out NYC Care? So we are constantly at the health department. We are constantly working with our partners at Health and Hospitals and uh, City Hall and uh, and other agencies. Uh, to talk about how to improve access to care. So those conversations have been going on uh, since the beginning of this administration. Do you think that this is a good bill that we're hearing today? Given so at care? the health department, we support universal access to health insurance and universal access to health care. So you think this is a good bill? We support the intent of the bill. We at the health department are always interested in improving access to health care for all populations. Uh, but do you think that this bill improves access to health care for vulnerable populations? So I don't want to speak to the specifics of the bill, but we do. But you're here today to testify on a bill. That's why we called you. That's why we called the health department here today. So to we're not, happy to, to not talk about intent, but to actually talk about what the bill is. That's why we've waited so long to have the hearing <clears throat> and communicating with the administration. It's not about conception here or concept. It's about actually getting to the nitty gritty. You worked on the task force. You were involved with Action Health, which included FQHCs. You were a point person in that. You were advising City Hall, as you just said, on continuing to expand healthcare access. So given all those factors, I would like to know what in this bill you think in any way is problematic. So we are certainly happy to have conversations. Uh, we're having conversations publicly at a hearing, not private conversations. That's what the hearing setting is for. So I would I'd like to understand, you, we've shared this bill with you for a long time. You worked on the task force. You worked on Action Health. You said you're advising City Hall on rolling out NYC Care and creating a universal access program, I'd like to understand what things you think in this bill are problematic. So we are, uh, as I said, Speaker, we are absolutely interested in having conversations not just with the council but with all of our community partners on the specifics of the bill and on how to get to universal access and how to improve access to health care. That's something we've been doing for years that we're constantly doing with health and hospitals, but um, we are not, uh, uh, we do not have, I do not have answers on specific provisions of, uh, of this bill. But when it comes to those conversations, we're more than happy to have those conversations. Um, and I do want to stress that we are constantly working with our partners across city government to, uh, to figure out how we can improve access to health care. Okay, but the, the, the administration has been going around saying that NYC Care is a universal health care access plan. You're advising them or you have advised them in your role at DOHMH and in your previous roles. You, so you have a bill in front of you today because we do not believe is the universal access program. And 
this happens time and again with the administration where we have hearings, we share bills far ahead of time, we are in constant communication with agency staff and with other staff, and then we come to a hearing and we aren't getting direct answers. The answers that we need are for the advocates that are in the room today, for the press, for the council members that have taken time out of their busy schedule to be here. So that is why I expected that the Department of Health, which is the largest public health agency uh, in the city of New York, would show up today with actual uh, uh, granular, uh, specific feedback on this bill. And I think it's shocking that that's not the case. So there's nothing you want to say specifically about the council's bill that we're hearing today. So at the department, we support NYC care. We think it was strategically developed and we support the administration and health and hospitals efforts to implement NYC care. Uh, it was uh, implemented and designed based on the learnings from Action Health. Our, our colleagues at health and hospitals are thoughtful about how they uh, not just roll out NYC care, but other initiatives that impact people's access to health care. And so I don't want to get into the, uh, the specifics of the bill because my colleagues at health and hospitals are uh, rolling out uh, NYC care, which is the, uh, the largest program of its kind, will be the largest program of its kind in the country, and it builds on the learnings from the task force and action health. So uh, Dr. Katz may have more to say about uh, the specifics of uh, what those plans look like, but we are supportive of those at the health department. So you don't think it's problematic that there is no site on Staten Island? So we, we are, just like our colleagues at Health and Hospitals, want access to health care for people across the city. So uh, there are uh, health care providers. I understand there's no acute care facility from Health and Hospitals on Staten Island, but there are, um, we are certainly supportive of having access to health care for people across the city. That's what this bill does. I'm very confused. Okay, I'm going to turn it back to Chair Levine. Um, Thank you so much, Speaker Johnson. Uh, I see you haven't forgotten everything from your days as health chair. Good to know. You know, I, I, I want to emphasize that we consider NYC care to be uh, a welcome and important step forward. But this is our shot to do this right, to go big, to be comprehensive, to reach everybody who is currently being left behind by the mainstream medical system. The numbers are huge, probably a half million people in the city who don't have health insurance, and most of them are not going to be able to enroll in the publicly subsidized plans, no matter how much outreach that we do. And they are in every single neighborhood of this city. They are in every single community board of the city. And at a time when we have a mayor and a council that are in agreement on the principle of universal health care, we feel really strongly that we have to do this right. Uh, we might not have an opportunity like this again. Um, and so I, I, I do want to remind everybody just what this FQHC movement is in that context. I know you know this, but you know, these are, <laughs> this is a movement that emerged out of activists in the civil rights era that wanted to take health care out of big, out of touch institutions into the neighborhoods where low income people, people of color, and immigrants um, have often been suffering in isolation. Um, this is a nonprofit sector. This is a sector deeply rooted in the very communities of color and immigrant communities that they are serving. This is a sector where cultural competence and, and multilinguality are just totally in the DNA. Uh, and when I heard you describe kind of the components of good health care, I wrote down some of the words. You talked about the importance of relationships and trust. You talked about the importance of proximity, geographic proximity for primary care. And you talked about building on existing structures. We have an existing structure of 500 community-based clinics that, that embody all these values that you quite eloquently expressed. And I'm trying to understand why they weren't included in NYC care. And the, the only possible explanation 
uh, one, one which I also don't accept, and I'll talk more about that, but the only possible explanation would be an objection based on cost. Is, is that the basis of the administration's objection to including these institutions? Well, again, I, I do disagree in the sense that I, I feel that the federally qualified health centers are part of it. Um, but you're right that we're not paying them. Um, so, and, and we did deal with this issue in, in Los Angeles and uh, San Francisco, and there are people here in this room even more expert. There, there are complicated issues about paying, uh, about local governments paying federally qualified health centers for care um, because of the, the mandate that the higher rate of reimbursement of an FQHC for the Medicaid population is meant in part because of their care of people who are uninsured. But I don't see this as an insurmountable barrier or something that we can't uh, together make happen. Um, the, again, I, the, 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 the only thing that, uh, that we haven't done is we haven't sent dollars. I mean, we, we, was, we met with the FQACs. We, we, I totally understand, like, the last thing I would want is someone has a great relationship with their federally qualified health center doctor or nurse practitioner. They hear about this program, and they think they have to disenroll. And that's why we, were, we worked with the FQHCs. Let's make sure the scripts say, no, keep going um, to that center and come to us for specialty care and why we've put so much effort into how do we make that specialty care really work? How do we pay, like FQHCs can do the primary care medications, but they can't do the rheumatologic agents because they're bigger than the budgets of some FQHCs, some of those drugs. Um, so, but I, I, I totally understand, and I, and I see there is a, there's a road forward here, um, and I think I, certainly I'd like to focus on, you know, walking that road with all of you. Okay, you, di you didn't exactly take the bait on the cost issue, and uh, I, I want to have that discussion. I, I believe that the stakes here justify a robust investment in this, especially if, as the speaker mentioned, we're going to live up to the promise of being a truly universal healthcare system. That's not going to be cheap. And I want to emphasize something you know and you've articulated, that every dollar we spend up front on prevention in a primary care setting is going to save us, save h and &H money from avoiding crisis cases that land in the emergency room, which first and foremost is bad for patients, but also imposes a financial burden on the health and hospital system. But I do want to push back on this notion that the FQHCs are included. If, if I'm an Asian immigrant in Flushing and I hear reports of, of this thing called NYC care and I, I, I look up the, the terms of the program, I'm going to learn that there's no eligible facilities in my community. Um, I don't think H&H &H has uh, a facility Correct. in Flushing. It's a, I think that's the biggest concentration of immigrants in Queens, probably one of the biggest in America. Um, but, you know, there's something called Charles B. Wayne Community Health Center mm -hmm. that is in multiple neighborhoods, Flushing being one of them. And, you know, that, that Asian immigrant is going to know Charles B. Wayne. They're going to know that they will speak their language, any of the variety of Asian languages. Uh, there's going to be a level of trust there that they might not feel elsewhere. And this is all about reducing barriers for people who are scared right now. In the in Trump era, they're scared of being institutions, they're scared of government, um, and we have to do everything we can to make them feel comfortable. And it, it, nonprofits like Charles B. Wang are not uh, one of the places that you can go with your NYC care card currently to get your annual physical, to get your vaccinations, to get your referrals to specialists. Is that not accurate? Well, again, so I, I think it's a wonderful federally qualified health center, and they would certainly, and they should speak for themselves, they would do those things now. So I think the question then uh, on it, right, so if someone calls that clinic, they're going to provide that service for that person. That is their mandate as an, a federally qualified health center to not say no. I think if New York has the ability to also provide additional funding, that would be a great thing. I'll say, for example, in health, 
in, when we did Healthy San Francisco, we were very careful that the dollars were articulated for the administrative costs of the, the FQHC taking the person in, not for the care. Because what we heard from our FQHC colleagues is that if you're receiving 330 federal funds for taking care of uninsured people in your program, you can't be receiving other funds. So there, but there are, that's what, there is a road here. There are, we did provide them support. We didn't provide them support for the care. We provided them support for the wraparounds, and I can see how we could do that here too. I, I just want to be clear that, that some of this is complicated because of, of the rules, and again, the people in this audience much more articulate about talking about FQHC rules than I am. Right, look, thank, thank goodness we live in a city that doesn't turn people away in healthcare institutions. That, by the way, is not new, but it, it is, it's a core value to New York City that we're all really proud of. Um, but still, there are hundreds of thousands of people who are not coming in for primary care. They're not getting annual physicals. Right. And that is dire health consequences for them and for, broad, broadly speaking, public health. And the whole idea of NYC care and the programs that you created elsewhere is to reduce the barriers, to build trust, to build support systems, to have people guided into these services. Not because they don't already exist, but because for a variety of reasons people aren't accessing them. And you know, you get an NYC care card, I think it has prices listed either on the card or in supporting documentation. Those are the prices for H&H, &H, and they don't apply in Charles B. Wang or any FQHCs, they're out of whack. Um, it, it's just one more way in which the system is not seamless until everybody's under the same umbrella, until we can unify uh, pricing, so we can unify referrals, um, and, and, and that is not uh, the way the structure of the program is currently. Um, I, I want to ask you about the resources within H&H. &H. Um, it, it, it's so important that, as you've now brought in 7,500, uh, which is which are a, a significant number, and one I commend you for achieving in the early months, um, you're going to need to have the staffing to serve them. And, even before uh, you launched NYC Care, um, we have had serious concerns about adequate staffing uh, in your facilities, um, especially not only, but especially in, among nurses um, who are really uh, overburdened right now and have excessive patient loads. Um, and that has implications for the staff, but also for patients, and you know this uh, it impacts health outcomes. So uh, I'm worried now that as you're adding an extra load on some of your facilities that already overstrained staff um, are, including nurses, but all the frontline providers are only going to be more strained. Can you assure us that this is not happening? Sure. Well, well first, Chair, you were right. Uh, my impression on coming when I first got here is that there was inadequate nurse staffing. Um, and I've been very clear um, that that's true and that we should, that we have to address that. Uh, and we have, uh, we in the first year uh, added 330 nurses despite, you know, trying to close a deficit and we're going to add more nurses in this year. Um, and that has to happen no matter what happens with this program. Um, the, we are also aware and we want, we're working with our great colleagues at NISNA to fix the fact that we have, we will hire new nurses, um, but often the salary structure is such that after two or three years, we're totally non-competitive with the rest of the market, and so we devote a lot of money to training nurses. It can take nine months to train an ICU nurse, and then we might lose him or her at year two or three, which is yet another kind of loss to us, right? Uh, not to mention that you can't possibly provide great care if all your nurses are new. It's good to have new nurses, and it's good to have really experienced nurses and have them all be together. Um, so, you know, I, I, I totally agree with your assessment. The idea of the program and the, the reason we're rolling it out in this way has always been figure out what the workload will be and staff up ahead in time so that so far, no, I can guarantee you that so far, 
the 7,500 people have not resulted in the kinds of problems. But, but I work on it with Marielle and Dr. Longo every day, right? Like, do we have enough access? Can we make this happen? And I've told them specifically, even with the goal, look, at the end of the day, these were goals, right? Don't provide bad care. If we, can, if we can't hit the goal, then we're not gonna hit the goal, but we're not gonna provide bad care. So, I mean, I, this is a work in progress. Um, I, I like your ideas about how we, you know, make this broader. Um, you have my commitment that if I felt that we did not have enough staffing, uh, I would be back here or I would be saying, look, this program has to go on hold um, until we as a collective city figure out how to fund it. I don't believe in doing things badly. I mean, there, there, are, there are a lot of ways in which the public hospitals are essentially subsidizing our voluntary hospitals. Correct. You serve um, more uninsured patients, you, and you serve more behavioral health patients, and other cases which are not profitable. And the volunteers are relying on, on this. Um, but I don't think we pay enough attention to the extent to which you're also a training ground for great staff that then are hired away at higher salaries. And, and I, I'm sympathetic to your plight on that. Um, when, when, when we raise salaries, hopefully that gap will close. But there's another important way that you can keep your staff longer. Staff that uh, is committed to being in public hospitals. They're there because they believe in the mission that the same reason that you and your team are in public hospitals. They believe in the mission. And one way you can ensure that you keep them, that they don't burn out, is that they have adequate patient loads. Okay. Right? This, is a, this is a critical way you will retain staff longer. Um, uh, it's first and foremost good for patients, but also um, it, it's good for uh, the staff as well. The, the last question, then, then I'll pass it on. Um, our, the mayor's management report, the MMR this year, um, listed something that I haven't understood that I just want to give you a chance to, to help us understand. Um, in 2018, uh, the H&H system saw about 1,112,000 patients, and in 2019, the system saw uh, 1,080,000. And um, uh, can you explain that drop in patients given all the important expansion and services that you have sure. implemented? So. Health and hospitals, and this is one of our weaknesses, has always been a hospital system. And hospitals across New York State um, are experiencing decreased volumes, and that's mostly a good thing. Um, childhood vaccinations, right? When I was a resident, every hospital had 30 patients who were in the pediatric ward. Now we often have one or two because childhood immunizations have eliminated the need to have hospital to hospitalize kids. So we in all systems are experiencing a decrease in hospital volume, and I'm happy about that. But it doesn't in any way negate your points about the person out there. Dr. Long saw, uh, as part of uh, the program, a gentleman in the Bronx who had not seen a doctor for 40 years, um, had their first visit in 40 years through NYC Care. Um, so uh, what we want to be is a system of primary care access that addresses the issues you so articulately talked about that prevents illness. And I'd be thrilled if a future management report showed those numbers even lower. Um, but I want the, the lower hospital numbers to be next to more primary care visits, more pap smears, more colon cancer screening, uh, lower blood pressures, better hemoglobin A1Cs, uh, more people getting, you know, either young women, uh, if they want to become pregnant, getting uh, folic acid and health guidance. If they don't want to be getting pregnant, getting uh, long-acting birth control. The, that's where we should be. That, that's the place. You know, let the volumes of the hospitals drop. Let us do a better job. I, I'll just add one thing because you had mentioned it. Behavioral health. So you're aware this is a city with, with uh, large numbers of huge, successful, nonprofit systems. We, H&H, &H, we do 60% of the behavioral health for the city. The rest of the city hospitals do 40%, right? What better example could there be of the subsidy? 
Why is that? Because mental health services are not well reimbursed. So we keep doing it, and we'll keep doing it, and I'm proud to keep doing it. That's our mission. But it's essentially a subsidy, right? Because the other hospitals have gotten out of that business because no matter how efficient you are, you can't break even. You do it, you do it out of mission. You don't do it as a business. Yeah. And if I may underscore something that Dr. Katz said, I think NYC Care is really trying to fundamentally change the way that we're providing care to our uninsured patients. We know that um, half of our uninsured patients only come to see us through the emergency department. And we agree with you that the backbone of the healthcare system is community health centers. And so we're really investing in our Gotham health centers. We have um, planned for three new, large, beautiful community health centers uh, across the city over the coming years. Um, and uh, I think that, um, you know, we agree with your sentiment that that is really where we want people to receive care um, in the community with um, additional providers that we'll be able to hire and their care teams through this program. Good. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to pass it off to uh, Chair Rivera. Thank you. Hello. I know we have a lot of uh, advocates and people waiting to testify, so I'm going to try to blaze through some of these. So I would ask that we be or brief, okay? So, Dr. Katz, I bring this up to you every time in terms of transparency with health and hospitals and trying to have a, a, a great relationship of trust and making sure that we're getting some of the documentation that we're constantly promised and committed to, and we still really haven't received any of the financial documents that, were, that, we, that we were expecting during budget negotiations, and we didn't place any terms and conditions on H&H &H because we decided that we were going to let you kind of provide these documents to us. And, and NYC CARE is no exception in that we don't really have any numbers. So I'm gonna ask you a few questions about some of the numbers, staffers, salaries, a lot of things that are unknown that I think should be public information. Everyone knows how much you make, right? Dr. Cass, they know how much I make, so we're gonna talk about it. So how many staff have been hired to work on NYC CARE specific tasks? Um, so we've, so I've been hired. <laughs> um, we've hired um, some other administrative staffers as well. How many? Uh, I believe uh, we have three total. Um, and we've also hired uh, staff to staff the 24-hour call center. What would you um, estimate number? For the call center? Mm -hmm. uh, approximately 50 full-time equivalent staff. Um, clinical staff, how many clinical staff would you say we added? We expect across the city to add uh, 60 care teams, so the primary care providers and then the teams that support them to provide care um, to uh, the patients that we expect to come through our doors through the program. I don't have the specifics on the, the number of providers, but I know that um, in the past number of years, we've been able to hire 37 primary care providers. Uh, and I wonder if Dr. Ted Long can jump in here as well. Wait, I, I just want a little bit of clarity. The 37 <coughs> primary care doctors is something that in your mission to kind of restore the reputation of H&H, &H, Dr. Katz, you have not only hired more nurses, you hired more primary care physicians. That's part of the larger mission of you coming in and really trying to change up and close this deficit. Do you, for NYC care specifically, we have the, the three kind of administrators, the 50 call center employees, and then you said 60 care teams? Mm -hmm. Can you but talk? But that's for the whole, that's when rolled out. Right. By 2020, right. there will be 60 teams. By 20? And uh, tell the chair how many, what constitutes a team? Yeah, I'd love to hear about that. Okay, doctor. Yeah. yeah, so uh, I can first answer your question. Uh, good to see you. Hi. About um, the 37 primary care providers. So that was with our Docs for NYC Care campaign where we identified after Dr. Katz and I had been here for about six months that so it was a critical issue we needed to get the providers we need for our existing patients. Uh, we set out to hire 70 primary care providers, and the number 37 comes from even in the first half of that period alone, we were a bit ahead of schedule. So that's where we, we publicly announced that. Since then, we're pretty close to hitting that. 
um, that number. The primary care team, uh, as I, I'm a primary care doctor myself, so I have a dedicated PCA to me, and then we have nurses that operate at the, the top of their scope and are honestly, I think, the best nurses in the world um, that are um, part of each primary care team. Certain number of nurses per every four primary care providers. We also have different other members of the team, too, social workers who focus on depression care, social workers who social, focus on social determinants of care, and now proud to uh, say clinical pharmacists. But every time we, we hire a new provider, including for NYC care, we have to have every other member of the team there because I can't do it alone as a primary care provider. So as soon as we get each provider identified, we fill in the rest of the team as well. I'm, I'm going to ask about the community provider in a second, but is NYC care changing nurse to patient staffing ratios at all with this rollout, considering that you've enrolled 7,500 uh, people because there is a, a, an incredible campaign going on by, by NISNA to make sure that we finally get safe staffing ratios in our hospitals. And I want to make sure that as we are doing more and more outreach, that we are looking at those numbers to finally get them at the levels that, that are safe and that are, are practical. So in transparency, when I arrived, there were no nurse ratios or nurse staffing. Every hospital was staffed in every clinic based on whatever historically it was, which sometimes was great and sometimes wasn't great, but whatever it was, it was. And if there were five nurses due there and three were out because of they had to be, then there were two nurses. And there was no, there was no sense, so um, we began the, the hard work of every ward has to have a true nurse ratio. And the ratio has to be based on the severity of the illness. So we've now finished uh, ratios for every single inpatient ward. Um, we're working now on ED, and I think they've, fin have they now finished the outpatient? Or we they're have. still working on it? And they've done the outpatient. Yep. So the idea is that every clinic has a ratio of how many nurses are needed in order to care for the patients that we have safely, and we will work hard to implement it, and we also you know, agree uh, with NISNA that unless you provide adequate nursing, then the care is not safe. Mm -hmm. On, in your testimony, Dr. Katz, you say, uh, going to the community provider piece, that the non-health and hospitals FQHCs developed a call center process and scripting for health and hospitals to ensure that their patients were redirected back to them. We have since met with them again to ensure the process is working. Additionally, primary care providers external to the health and hospital system are, are listed as community provider on NYC care members' cards. What do you consider a community provider? I'm going to ask Dr. Long. Yeah, so a community provider for us would be a provider at another FQHC who has a sustained relationship longitudinally with a patient and may be coming to us just for cardiology care. So if the patient's being referred from one of our excellent FQHCs to Lincoln Hospital for cardiology, um, we would enroll them in NYC care so they could see what their cardiology visit and cardiology-related medication um, payments will be, so we demystify all of that. Um, but we don't want to put on the card um, uh, a primary care provider in our system because we want them to stay with the longitudinal great relationship of primary care that they have at the existing FQHC that they come from. How are you working with some of the community-based organizations that have been doing this work for such a long time? And specifically, when it comes to patients who I guess are under 19, the number of uninsured children, we'll call them, is, is on the rise nationally. I, especially in states that did not expand Medicaid under the ACA, but I know that for New York, we've actually gone down a bit. We're, yes. I think, fifth in the nation. Right. But still, how do we reach that 2.5%, I think it was in 2018, of children who are not insured? Are you l utilizing these relationships and making sure that there are resources to our community-based organizations because they're the ones with the best relationships? Sure. You want to? Maybe really don't take that. I mean, I think uh, we want everyone across the city to have access to health insurance regardless of their age, regardless of their income, regardless of their immigration status. Um, and we have partnerships with these five community-based organizations in the Bronx who speak a total of 10 different languages, who have relationships with families, um, who can counsel them on um, what is available to them in the community, whether that's health insurance for their children under age 19, as you mentioned, or if they are ineligible for health insurance um, for those folks over age 19, NYC care as well. 
So you have a you are you have someone focused on a community outreach plan that is uplifting some of these community-based organizations, correct? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. It, are you in charge of that? Who's the person? Is this one of the three administrators? Yes, I oversee the, the program and its operations, including the outreach work as well. We have um, someone who works on strategic communications, um, someone who works, uh, uh, directs our operations, and someone who works on our community partnerships as well. Mm -hmm. Is there a metric for how H&H &H determines the average cost per uninsurable member of NYC CARE? can be done. We don't, we don't currently do it. You'd have to, uh, now that though that we have Epic, we probably could for the first time, you know, uh, we're going live, once we go live in December at King's, everything will be live. Um, because the, the previously all data would have existed on different computers, so how would you ever figure out all care? But now we can unduplicate, so we can in fact look at any one person. Of course, it would still miss care they received in other places, right? So like a, a Gouverneur patient that I saw yesterday brought me the ultrasound that she had gotten when she went to Mount Sinai. So they'll, right, we, there'll always be other things, but, but yeah, now we could. As you roll out in other boroughs, for example, have you identified the CBOs you're going to work with in Brooklyn and Staten Island? There's an RFP out now. Um, for them to apply, and we, we, we're sure we're going to get as promising a group as we had in the Bronx. <laughs> Applications are due on November 8th. November 8th? Great. I wanted to um, ask you, I wanted to ask specifically on some of the, uh, how many languages does the staff speak? How many new medical staff has been hired? I mean, these are, these are details that we're lacking. I also, I'm a little concerned at the financial data that, again, that we're lacking, and I know you mentioned that OMB is working on it. Do you not think that OMB is doing all of us a disservice by not providing that financial data as frequently as possible so we can be look at it and analyze it and try to support you? Because the health and hospital system is so incredibly important to all of us here, and we want to make sure that we're able to, to support your work. I, I appreciate that, and I feel supported, and I, I will keep working with my OMB colleagues. I, I, I certainly believe in transparency and that the board should see the numbers. I will I'll continue to, to talk with them about getting them those numbers. We want you to succeed, I uh, absolutely. That. So I want to ask, because you have this kind of mission, and this will be, I guess, I know we have a couple of members that have questions. Because you have kind of this mission, and much of it is very practical, which I appreciate, which is the billing and the coding and the EPIC system, which is, which is uh, we're going to have a hearing on that soon. Um, you mentioned that this also covers a broader list of services. But my question to you is, what services are you having the least success billing the insurance companies for? The our biggest problems with insurance companies are that they don't understand social determinants. They don't understand that I might be able to send you home on day two of your having a pneumonia because you have a loving family, and that I can't send home somebody who uh, has no one to bring them food or help them to a bathroom. To the insurance company, it's Pneumonia, two days, they should be out. Why are they still there? You know, we won't approve the day. We, we took care of, and I was very proud of this, and it was, I won't mention anything about the, the personal details, but it came to us through an advocate. We took care of somebody at H&H &H who was sent out of an amazing hospital system with two broken arms from the emergency room, elderly woman. Now, how are you supposed to manage at home with two broken arms? when you live alone. But she was an insured person, and technically speaking, you know, and she didn't have a reason to be hospitalized. So they sent her out. We, of course, would have kept her. We would have said, well, this is what we do. You know, you're an elderly person. You have two broken arms. How could you possibly get yourself to the toilet or food? So we, we were able to to bring her into one of our long-term care facilities. Um, so there's just no understanding that 
your, your family structure, your housing structure, whether you can get food, whether there are people. From insurance point of view, if pneumonia is three days, three days of payment. You so keep them five days, you should, that's your problem. So is it home care? Is that, is that what you're saying? Well, it's, it isn't even as simple as home care because often people don't have circumstances that you can care for them at home or four hours means nothing if you have two broken arms. No, it's more recognizing that certain people can't be sent home or, or conversely, certain people can't be cared for at home. Um, we, at all our hospitals, uh, uh, Mr. Nunez is a wonderful administrator for Lincoln and I recently worked on somebody where the family had just brought the person because they couldn't care for them any longer, right? And people bring them to public hospitals. I'm sorry, we can't take care of, he, he requires too much care. Insurance company says, well, but there's no, there's no reason for admission. We say, well, but what are we gonna do? We're gonna put this person out on the street no. Um, so we do it out of mission. Other hospitals simply say, well, that's how it is, but not us. And I appreciate that about health and hospitals. I really do, that you re truly t take care of everyone. So I, I know that we have uh, committee members with questions, so I want to give them an opportunity, and, and thank you for thank you. Thank you. Uh, answering as much as you could. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I believe that Councilmember Cohen has a question. Th uh, thank you, Chairs. Uh, Dr. Katz, nice to meet you face to face. I know we've spoken on the phone, yes. and uh, I know that. Do you know that uh, NCV is in my district? I see Christina here, and uh, you know uh, we really, you know, the speaker's been supportive every time I've gone to the speaker and say I want to help NCV. He's always been there, and and I expect that to continue. So, uh, I think that you know that if you know you need my support, it's always there. Thank you. Uh, you know, I guess, and I was the chair of the mental health committee uh, uh, last term, but. I, I have not been, you know, and I'm new to the health committee now. Uh, so first, I just want to say, you know, what, uh, I, I was very concerned about the, the structural deficits at, at, at health and hospitals, and I'm, I'm sort of really sort of staggered to say, well, we decided to bill insurance, and we're, that's making us financially viable. Like, can you, can you expand on that a little bit about just what was going on? And sure. What, what's uh, well, changed? Or? I mean, I wasn't here, but this would be my understanding. Uh, prior to the ACA, Poor people did not have insurance unless they had a disability. So that was the small group of people. So large numbers in a place like New York City of low-income people without insurance. The ACA comes along and the federal government says, we're giving people insurance now, um, and so we're gonna cut the subsidies to public hospitals because you don't need as much money because you're going to have all of these people who have insurance. But because the culture of health and hospitals was always, well, we provide care for free, n nobody really turned on the mechanism. In the case, and my, my great uh, public health colleague, uh, public health did a great job of enrolling people in communities to get insurance, but if they were already going to a wonderful place like NCB, nobody felt they had any need. They went to NCB, they got great care, the care was free, no one, no one articulated, the, the patient didn't articulate they needed insurance, and the system didn't articulate that they needed insurance. So we, we weren't enrolling the people who could have been enrolled and who could have paid, and then we never had the infrastructure to bill, and as I was uh, alluding to, and I'm very open, some insurance companies have incredibly predatory practices. You know, you, the patient needs care, but you didn't call them, you know, an hour before, disallowed. Um, you didn't fill out this form, disallowed. You, you didn't get the bill to us soon enough, disallowed. And health and hospitals just live that life. Um, and so once we said no, in order to fulfill our mission, we don't want money from people but we want the money from the insurance, it did turn out to be a rather large amount of money and there was necessary administrative cuts that went along with it. So it wasn't all, right, it was saying fewer cars, fewer space, fewer administrators, uh, put all our money into nurses, doctors, pharmacists. Yeah, I, I don't you know, my, my wife is a physician and I hear her appealing the denials all the time and she's dictating. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, could you just, I don't know if there is somebody who is uninsurable in New York City. 
uh, and what those, who those people are, and what is their experience if, if they have a very, if they have cancer, what is their what is their uh, course or what sure. happens to them? So there are probably about three hundred thousand people in New York City who are uninsurable uh, because they don't have documents um, that would get them Medicaid, um, plus some who are insurable, but but the copays are unaffordable to them. Um, so what would happen is they, they would go to a health and hospital facility. Um, if they, in an emergency, all hospitals under the EMTALA laws, which your wife would know all about, uh, have to be seen through an emergency room. But cancer is one of the examples where there's a huge hole because you don't need to be seen in an emergency room. You need your chemotherapy. But there's no way to pay for that chemotherapy, and so all of those people would get care. And, and fortunately, we have several uh, places that are centers of excellence for the care of people with cancer at health and hospitals. So it, within the system? Yes, okay. they would, they'd have to go within the system. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, Councilmember Cohen, and I believe Councilmember Holden has a question. Thank you, Doctor, for your testimony. And you mentioned something earlier about that gentleman who couldn't afford the copay for his inhaler. Um, is that a regular occurrence that you're seeing? Um, and how do you learn about that? With follow up or uh, calls to the individual? Well, in his case, because I was, I was his, he came to me as a doctor at, at my practice at Gouverneur. But yes, we hear about it all of the time. And, and frankly, there are even blogs. Um, on the internet of people all over this country who are insured and cannot pay for their medications um, because the, the medication is covered. But what if covered means $60 and you're a day laborer? So what do you do in that case? Let's say somebody, you, you do a follow-up call. Right, though. so what I, I mean, what I did is I got him the medicine, but yeah. I could do that because of health and hospitals. But is, so, but is that, that seemed, I mean, I even did that because the copay was ridiculous. And I said, I'm not going to take this. I don't even, you know, so it's like you don't, you don't, and it's really self-defeating, though, when you go to see a doctor, they recommend or they prescribe this and that. And it's the cost. And so I think if, if we have something built in that we could actually fix that, um, what, are you, what are some suggestions you have? So uh, the big thing we're doing is we're establishing retail pharmacies at all our facilities. So previously, health and hospitals uh, had pharmacies for people who were uninsured, but we didn't accept people who were insured, which was not a smart business decision on our part, and it also makes it impossible to solve for this person, because the person who had the $60, I'll get enough from his insurance to cover my cost on the medication. So I'll be able to give him his medication. I won't lose money. I won't use any of the city subsidy meant for the uninsured. He'll get his medicine. But to do that, I need retail pharmacy, because I have to be able to bill his insurance for the part that they will pay. Um, and health and hospitals, for unclear reasons, gave up all of its retail pharmacy ability about 10 years ago. And now we're reestablishing that in all our clinics. Oh, good, great, thank you. Uh, just one other question to follow up on Council uh, Members um, Rivera's question about the annual average cost for uninsured patients. You said you could figure that out now. You can actually come up with an estimate. Uh, how long would that take to, to get those numbers? Well, it's, uh, I'll go back now and look at, at uh, well, first, I think to have it true, it ha we have to go live in Brooklyn. So that's December. And starting, therefore, in January, we would have our entire system, and I would be able to uh, take out. So, you know, I think that's information that we could certainly uh, work on for February, March. February, March. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, cheers. Thank you so much. Councilmember Holden, and thank you, Dr. Katz, thank and you. the entire panel. Thank you. And I would like to call up now our next panel, which includes Helen Schaub from 1199 SEIU, uh, Valerie, uh, also Valerie Goffe, sorry for the mispronunciation, at 1199. Uh, Judith Cutchin from New York State Nurses Association. Uh, 
uh, Rose Duhan from Chicanes and Sonia Lawrence. Um, sorry, this is also a nice in a person. So Sonia Lawrence from Lincoln Hospital. And I know that uh, because Helen is on uh, a very, very short timetable, if it's okay with the rest of the panel, um, we'll have Helen kick us off. All right, so um, I'm, we're gonna actually do this together um, because that's part of what we wanted to demonstrate is uh, uh, all pieces of this uh, supporting this idea. Um, so then we'll make room because I know there's one, one f a couple fewer seats. Um, so you've heard a lot of the statistics I think that were uh, in this, uh, in our testimony. Um, just uh, let me introduce ourselves first and then I'll we're going to be super quick. So my name is Helen Schaub. I'm the Policy and Legislative Director for 1199. Hi, I'm Valerie Goff. I'm an employee for h and and a delegate for 1199. My name is Lori Anze. I work at the Community Health Center of Richmond in Staten Island. So I think the broader point, I mean, everybody obviously in their earlier testimony talked about the need, the ways in which in order to truly provide universal health care access and to reduce avoidable hospitalizations, especially at h and which sees so many of the uninsured uh, in, in the acute care side, uh, that we really need this legislation, which expands the good work that NYC CARES is doing to the broadest range of trusted community provider. So basically, we're here to support this legislation. Um, and I think uh, we wanted to do it together because we really, as a labor union that represents uh, workers in h and &H and in the clinics in h and and in the emergency rooms, like where Valerie works, as well as workers in FQHCs throughout the city, I think we really have a perspective that shows the quality care that's delivered in all of those contexts and the ways in which all of those uh, providers, including the frontline workers, are necessary to truly provide quality access uh, for all of our residents throughout the city. So we're here in support of this legislation. We really want to thank both chairs as well as the speaker for introducing it and moving it. Um, and I just want to have Valerie uh, and Linda say a couple of words about the work that they do and their perspective uh, from where they sit. Okay. Um as I said, I'm an emergency room licensed practical nurse. I literally hear the cries of, in the community that I work, it's an uh, immig uh, immigrated po population, heavy population, and these people, they cry, they, when, they're not, when they will not talk to the doctors or the administrators, they cry on us. They tell us, you know, they're afraid, they're, you know, we hear their pain. I mean, we all sit around and hear, talk about statistics and numbers, but this preventive expressive care service is badly needed. We used to have clinics all over the places where people did feel comfortable to go to, so now what's happening is emergency room is being overpopulated, the staff is being stressed, and the care is not really gonna be rendered because people are trying to, trying to satisfy the administration and get the job done, and who are hurting is the patients that's feeling the pain. Go ahead, Linda. Hi, I work at the front desk of the Community Health Center of Richmond in Staten Island, and unfortunately we do not have a hospital there that is an right. HHC. Yep. There are very few and far places that people can go. Where I work is in Port Richmond, which is a heavily undocumented area. We do have a lot of people that are scared, but we do have a lot of people that do come in and they feel like it is a community. A lot of people, it's nice to see when they bring their children who are insured, that there are parents who are taking care of themselves even though they are undocumented and they are coming in for the care. So we are taking care of the whole entire family. So just in closing, and I know we have a lot of advocates uh, who are here in support of this legislation, but again, we want to support it. We think it's the right step to expand, H to expand NYC CARES. 
uh, to be fully comprehensive. We also just want to say a brief word in support of the resolution. Um, and if you can just turn that mic on, because oh, we're sorry. not picking you up. Yeah, we want to say a brief word in support of the resolution. Uh, we've, you know, our union in our constitution uh, says that we're for universal health care. We fought for that in the trenches, on the doors, uh, in many different ways uh, for a long time. And, uh, you know, anything that Albany can do, we're up there trying to make sure that they can invest the resources that are necessary to provide access for the folks that do not have it. Um, so thank you very much for having us, and we'll, we'll make some room. Isn't thank you so much for speaking and for your work in this important, important sector. Please, Judith. Hello. Am I on? Okay. Hi, my name is Judith Kutchin. I am a nurse at Woodhall Hospital for the last 28 years um, in Brooklyn, one of the 11 of the wonderful public hospital systems. I am also on the board of the directors for the New York State Nurses Association and the executive council president that represents the public health system nurses, 8,500 of those nurses, wonderful, hardworking nurses. I thank you for the opportunity for allowing me to speak. And on behalf of NYSDA, we thank um, Councilman Levine and Councilwoman um, Carlina Rivera for their support. I'm here today to express in strongest terms our support for immigrants, especially those whose status under federal law makes them ineligible for financial participation. This onslaught against our immigrants at the federal level has to stop, and it does here in New York City, including in our public hospitals which remain open to all, regardless of their ability to pay or their immigration status. The City Council has displayed outstanding leadership in support of both the public hospitals and our city's diverse populations, including undocumented immigrants. The New York Care Program offered the promise of quality care to 600,000 uninsured New Yorkers, including undocumented immigrants. In spite of threats from Washington to limit Medicaid and other federal assistance to safety net hospitals, we here in New York must have enough resources to guarantee quality care under the New York Care Program. Otherwise, two-tiered health care systems in our city will prevail and with the addition of 600,000 new patients struggle even more. New York City Care offers the promise of extensive primary and acute care. Once in place, it holds promise of radically close the two-tier systems. And for undocumented immigrants, it, is, it means a decent life here, knowing that quality health care is within their reach. I am here today to ask you to understand that we cannot keep up with new demands on public hospital care without funding for enough nurses and other frontline staff caregivers to do the job. Since 2014, the number of nurses in New York City h and system has declined by 685, or more than 8 percent. This, while acuities that is more serious of the illness, increased 14 percent. New York City care got off to a good start in the Bronx, where half the target of the 10,000 new patients were accomplished. These factors in the public hospital, less nurses, sicker patients, a new program, New York City care, adding more patients. Well, this cannot be sustained. We believe that 120 million should be appropriate by, appropriated by the council to be specifically dedicated to hiring 1,000 nurses and other caregivers. The others are patient care techs, nurses aid, our LPNs, and other direct care providers and staff. This additional workforce can go a long way to meeting the health care demands of the public system and New York City cares add patients, including undocumented intimates. They, like all New Yorkers, deserve quality care. I, too, am a lifelong New York City Health and Hospital patient. I was born in, health, in New York City Health Care, uh, Kings County, and I've been a patient ever since. I won't tell you my age. And we support um, the, the 1668 to expand New York City care to FQHCs making, and make the private hospitals provide the same care if they get in the funding. And we also support Resolution 918 to expand the care to include the undocumented, our most vulnerable patients. Thank you. Good afternoon. 
My name is Sonia Lawrence, and I'm a nurse at Lincoln Hospital in the Bronx, part of the New York City Health and Hospital System. Lincoln is located in the South Bronx in a community with a large population of undocumented immigrants. It is in an area with many challenges, a few blocks from the 145th Street Bridge with Interstate 87 intersecting the neighborhood, dotting with deep, deep, the depots of garbage and other diesel trucks. The asthma and other lung ailments all alone would keep us busy. We are proud to provide quality care to immigrants and to all our patients, no matter their ability to pay or immigration status. New York Care launched an enrolled goal of 1,000 in the Bronx on August 1st and has already met more than half the goal. That is very good. But as more people enter our public system for care, we have to have enough nurses and other caregivers to do our jobs. Our emergency room treats more patients than any other city system. We understand the hardship of providing care in this setting. Still, we experience great satisfaction in treating patients, including undocumented immigrants. I speak for my fellow nurses at Lincoln Hospital in saying that a realistic budget allocation is needed to meet the additional demands already entering our system by way of New York care. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nurse Lawrence and Nurse Cutchin. And, and, and Nurse Cutchin, we're not going to ask what year you were born. We know it was in the 1980s. No, actually, 60s. Uh, and, and thank you to Nysna, which has been just so key in this fight and every healthcare fight. And, and Rose, you can take it away. Okay. Just turn up. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony in favor of Intro 1668. My name is Rose Duhan, and I'm the CEO of the Community Health Care Association of New York State, the primary care association for federally qualified health centers. And I want to thank uh, Council Member and Chair Levine for reminding us of the community health center history, because it really is about ensuring access to, to underserved communities in their communities for people who would otherwise not have care. JK News is the voice of community health centers that serve as leading providers of primary care in New York State. We work closely with more than 70 federally qualified health centers, also known as community health centers, that operate over 800 sites statewide and, as has been mentioned, 500 sites here in New York City. FQHCs are nonprofit, community-run clinics located in medically underserved areas that provide high-quality, cost-effective primary care, including behavioral health services and oral health services, and dental care is especially difficult to access for so many people who do not have insurance, and even people who do have insurance often do not have dental care. So ensuring that access is so important. The mouth is part of the body and needs to have um, medical care just like the rest of the body. All health centers are required to have a sliding fee scale for patients under 200% of the federal poverty limit. Federal law also mandates that a majority of health center board members be patients of that health center, ensuring that the center is reflective of and responsive to their community. So it is the communities, community members that govern the community health centers and ensure that the services and the way that they are delivered reflect the community. The 500 community health center sites in New York City scattered throughout all five boroughs and in nearly every community district create an expansive primary care safety net. 1.4 million, or one in seven, New York City residents receive care at a community health center. Health centers are experts at providing care to those most in need. More than 90% of health center patients in New York are below 200% of the federal poverty limit. 62% receive Medicaid, and 16% 16 16 are uninsured, which is three times the statewide rate of 5% uninsured. Last year, New York Health Center served 220,000 uninsured New Yorkers, approximately one-third of all uninsured residents. Community health centers are more than just a doctor's office. They provide a full range of culturally appropriate, comprehensive health and support services, including physical health, behavioral health, and as I said, dental services. In addition, they provide enabling services, such as arranging for transportation, case management, insurance enrollment assistance, and health education. 
While all health centers are required to provide care to anyone seeking it, some health centers have special expertise in serving certain populations, people experiencing homelessness, migrant ar agricultural workers, refugees, and people from the LGBTQI community. Community health centers also operate approximately 125 school-based health centers in New York City. Chicane is, pl is pleased to support Intro 1668, which would create a health access program in New York City aimed at bringing the over 600,000 uninsured New Yorkers into care. Under the program, enrollees would be offered a medical home providing comprehensive primary care in their community district and a patient navigator to assist them in accessing services. Chicanis has been supportive of the recently implemented New York City Care, and I want to thank our partners at H&H, &H, um, and that it has proved to be um, an important route to access, especially for um, especially specialty care for H F F FQHC patients, because community health centers do, um, do not provide a lot of specialty care. Um, I would be remiss if I did not mention that Gotham Health, a federally qualified health center and member of Chicanis, is a critical component of the expansive network of New York City health centers, providing comprehensive primary care services to hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers every year. We work closely with health and hospitals and Gotham leadership to have a pre and appreciate the transparency and open communication with Chicanis and the other New York City health centers as New York City care has gotten underway. So thank you. Chicanis urges the City Council to work with the administration to build on the early successes of the New York City Care Program by leveraging the breadth and expertise of the 500 community health center sites throughout the city. All health centers share a common mandate to provide high quality, comprehensive primary care services to anyone seeking care, regardless of insurance coverage, income, or immigration status. Chicanis is appreciative of, eight, of Intro 1668's effort to design a health access program that incorporates all of New York, State, New York City's community health centers. Chicanis looks forward to working with the council and the administration to ensure that Intro 1668 utilizes and embraces the city's strong primary care safety net. We wholeheartedly support enhancing access to care throughout New York City by leveraging the full complement of community health centers in all five boroughs. Chicane supports Intro 60, 1668 and urges the Council and the Administration to design a health access program that supplements existing state and federal community health center funding, aligns with federal sliding fee scale requirements at community health centers, and supports the health center mandate to provide care to anyone who seeks it. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Rose. I just want to. Uh uh, remark on one more way that uh, Dr. Katz is exceptional <laughs> is that he's still here at the hearing <laughs> and it's very unusual for commissioners to remain after they're done speaking themselves and we appreciate that. It means a lot because the perspective that we're hearing here is very, very important. Um, uh, can you clarify, Rose, how many Community health centers are there, FQACs, in the five boroughs of New York City? There's 500 sites that community right. health centers operate. Um, that's about, I want to say about 40 um, organizations, different organizations that, um, that are located in the city. That's quite a large network. Um, and, and forgive me if you said this, um, how many patients a year does this network serve? Uh, 1.4 million in New York City. How many? Uh, 1.4 million last year that we served that, in New York City. That yes. probably is larger than any other institution. I mean, I think it's even more than than, than health and hospitals. Uh, well, it does, that does incorporate all of the Gotham. Ah, got it. So so we're, we're, we're double <laughs> counting a little bit. Yes, so there are hundreds, hundreds of thousands that are seen at, at Gotham Health. And then on top of that, um, all the other health centers also provide another, what did I say? That was <laughs> and up to one profession. Several of your members took part in the Action Health NYC pilot, correct? Correct. Um, I think it might have been, what was it, uh, 10, 11 sites? Yes, it was a pilot. Great. Um, can you reflect on the experience and the success of that pilot from the perspective of the community health centers? Um, I think the community health centers appreciated the opportunity to participate and to um, expand access to care for patients. Okay. Well, we certainly concur. Um, Okay. Thank you, uh, Rose. Thank you to the organizations you represent for what you're doing for health care on the ground in communities for 1.4 million people, including Gotham Health. Thank every you, and day. thank you to the council. Okay. Our next, our next panel uh, includes, uh, if, if he has been able to stay, I hope he has, Dr. Juan Tapia from Somos Community Care, Arlene Cruz from Make the Road, 
Max Handler from New York Immigration Coalition. Um, I believe this is also from, yes, all, from Planned Parenthood. Uh, Miriam Muhammad Miller. Uh, Natalie Interiano from Care for the Homeless. And Juan Pison from the Community Service Society. Oops, and one more, if we can fit, fit her in, Paloma Hernandez. This is an all-star panel, <laughs> if ever there was one. Uh, doctor, you want to kick us off? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I want to take this moment to thank the New York City Council Speaker, Corey Johnson, Community and Health Chair Council Member, Mark Levine, the Committee on Hospitals Chair Councilwoman, Carlene Rivera, and all of the council members that are here with us today. My name is Dr. Juan Tapia, and I am a physician in the SOMOS network. I want to start by mentioning uh, one of the speakers that mentioned that nowadays there are many patients that go to the hospitals that are vaccinated and we are seeing less of the infectious uh, diseases that were once prevalent in the 80s. And that has to do a lot of, with immunization, but it has to do also a lot with the primary care physicians. At SOMOS, we have more than 2,500 family doctors treating over 700,000 patients in traditionally underserved counties in the Bronx, Long Island, Queens, and certain pockets of Manhattan. I want to applaud the New York City Council for introducing bright, bright, groundbreaking legislation that will bring high quality to insure New Yorkers. At SOMOS, like myself, most of our doctors speak to our patients in their language. But their language is not Spanish or Chinese. We speak in the language of empathy. We have American doctors that speak no English to uh, Hispanic patients that do not understand English, but they know exactly what the doctor is saying. And this is through empathy, by knowing the community, we have doctors that are practicing where other doctors don't want to be, to, to be. I've been in practice in Washington Heights and in the South Bronx for more than 30 years when a lot of the hospitals used to send patients to the streets, newborn mothers, to find uh, providers on their own. And I was also here when Medicaid used to pay $8 for visits. And I was also here when they came up with a program for preferred providers for new, uh, new graduates that were paid around $40 per visit, and that was followed by managed care. And today, I am glad, and I hope that uh, this program continues, which is the program that pays physicians for keeping the patients well, and not for doing procedures, or seen 100 patients a day, that the main criteria is how well are you keeping the patient. And we agreed for a law that requires a medical home and at least one acute care hospital with specialists in each borough. The primary care providers are surviving due to the efforts of lawmakers that are making payments based and the high quality of care that we provide. We are now providing access, culturally competent care, and empathy in many languages. And I want to state that primary care providers were here way before Christ Christopher Columbus, because even though they didn't have modern medicine, they had the most important thing in medicine, which is empathy and the ability, the ability to listen to patients, and also always working with our most vulnerable uh, population. I thank you all. Thank you for this opportunity. 
Thank you, Dr. Tapia. Thank you. Max? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Max Hadler. I'm the Director of Health Policy at the New York Immigration Coalition. Um, I want to thank the chairs, uh, Levine and Rivera, for calling this hearing. Um, I first want to address NYC CARE in its current form. From the beginning uh, at the NYC, we've supported NYC CARE. We think it sends a really powerful message of inclusion uh, to immigrant communities that are under constant attack from Washington and the care coordination and customer service mechanisms that we think meaningfully improve care for uninsured New Yorkers, half of whom are undocumented. Um, we think the NYC CARE team at Health and Hospitals has done an admirable job getting the word out about the program along with community-based organizations like Emerald Isle and Sauti Yetu. Um, and we're also encouraged by the extended pharmacy hours that have yielded higher than expected utilization in the program's first few months. At the same time, we remain concerned about the pace of NYC CARE's methodical rollout across the remaining four boroughs and the $100 million promised investment, which we have said from the beginning, uh, that we think is insufficient. So in the meantime, we urge health and hospitals and the council um, in an oversight role to ensure that data are regularly made public on important program parameters as it ramps up. So this would include program spending details, total enrollment by age, gender, preferred language and geography, uh, information on clients deciding not to enroll in coverage or in NYC care because of public charge concerns or other immigration related fears. Um, indications that the collaborative care model is actually leading to increased access to behavioral health services and also the volume and types of calls into the customer service line. Um, we also have from the beginning expressed reservations about limiting a new citywide access to care program only to health and hospitals. The Action Health NYC pilot clearly demonstrated that improving linkages to community health between community health centers and health and hospitals has to be a priority in improving access to care for uninsured New Yorkers across all types of care that they need. Intro 1668 provides a framework for doing that, and we thank Council Members Levine and Rivera for launching this important effort. We think that Intro 1668 should build on the existing structure of NYC CARE, um, and also that any funding to implement the provisions of Intro 1668 be in addition to the at least $100 million that have already been allocated or promised to uh, the NYC CARE program in its current form. The expansions described in the bill can't be achieved with the existing funding. We urge the administration and the council to work together to make this a financial reality because it's really hard to imagine that a successful effort to guarantee comprehensive health access in New York City can not improve providers, cannot include providers beyond health and hospitals. Um, and finally, we enthusiastically endorse Resolution 918. We thank Council Member Adams and the Women's Caucus um, and Committee Chair Levine for bringing it up for consideration. The NYIC is one of the co-leads of the Coverage for All campaign. Uh, we have been working for years to get a state-funded essential plan introduced. We thank Senator Rivera and uh, Assemblymember Gottfried for leading the effort on that. Um, as one of the leads of this campaign, we greatly appreciate the Council's consideration of the resolution. We strongly urge its passage as a public and official declaration of the Council's willingness to stand up for affordable health care for all. Um, and I just want to say that while Governor Cuomo and other state leaders sit on their hands as hundreds of thousands of people continue to go without health insurance, it's gratifying to see the city, both the council and the administration, take action to improve access to care for immigrant New Yorkers, to contemplate how we can continue to improve upon the programs that we already have. We appreciate your efforts and we look forward to continuing to work with all of you until all New Yorkers have access to timely, affordable, high quality care. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Max. Um, at a time when immigrants in the city are justifiably scared because we have a madman in the White House, how are we going to overcome the obstacle of, of, of people who are fearful to participate in any government program, even a city government program? I think one of the approaches that um, lots of organizations are taking and that actually is already happening through NYC CARE is that community-based organizations are being funded to provide information and to do outreach. They're already a trusted source. And I think the broader message of creating universal programs is also very, very important. There may be hesitation overall because of public charge or because of other administrative attacks on immigrant communities, but creating a message that all of New York City and ideally all of New York State, except that the state is failing to act on it, is open to care and open to coverage for everyone. It sends an incredibly powerful message that functions as a bulwark against the federal government. We are not gonna persuade everyone who reasonably has fears about 
programs to enroll necessarily, but I think that there's a, already been a demonstration that we're mitigating the chilling effect of these administrative attacks through all of the community outreach and education and training that we're doing. And I think the, the best thing that we can do to counteract it is to continue to create programs and to promote programs that are open to everyone. Amen to that. Uh, Arlene? Good morning, well, good afternoon. So my name is Arlene Cruz and I'm a health programs manager at Make the Road New York. Thank you for giving us this opportunity today to provide testimony on the essential plan expansions through coverage for all and the NYC care bill. Um, Make the Road fully supports the city council's resolution in support of coverage for all bill. A5974 and S3900 to create a state funded essential plan for all New Yorkers up to 200% of the federal poverty level, regardless of their immigration status. Um, every year, Make the Road serves hundreds of uninsured New Yorkers who are anxiously awaiting um, the opportunity to be able to enroll into health insurance. Uh, since they're currently not eligible due to their immigration status. And even without access to health insurance, they understand the cost and life-saving implications for access to care. Yet, health insurance discrimination based on immigration status affects more than 400,000 New Yorkers. Uh, take, for instance, Antonio, Make the Road member, Bushwick resident for over 20 years, um, diagnosed with kidney failure. He receives, daily di uh, he receives dialysis at his local hospital, but he doesn't qualify for a kidney transplant because he's undocumented and uninsured. Due to his condition, he has a very limited income and is usually exhausted after, after his treatments, which he receives three to four times a week. Sometimes he's completely depleted and has faced week-long hospitalizations due to secondary effects. He doesn't have health insurance to assist with the cost of seeing his primary care doctor or prescription medication, which he needs on a consistent basis. Si tuviera un seguro médico, sería más fácil, menos costoso, me podría salvar la vida. If I had health insurance, it would be easier for me, less expensive, and it, would, and it could save my life, he said. The state's health care providers already spend nearly $130 million a year on uncompensated care for uninsured people. Coverage for All process proposes to create a state-funded essential plan which would help alleviate those costs. The essential plan, a popular federal program, um, has proven to be successful in New York and already has almost 800,000 enrollees. Additionally, because the essential plan is not part of the new public charge rule, it wouldn't be impacted, and even if the horrific new rule goes into effect. Already a functioning, a functioning mechanism, the essential plan should serve as an ideal health program model to replicate at the state level to cover immigrants not eligible for health insurance because of their status. Make the Road also supports NYC care programs since its inception. We were one of the CBOs participating in the Immigrant uh, Health Task Force in 2014 that helped create the pilot. Action Health Project several years ago and even coordinated a member-based focus group to provide feedback prior to launching the program. We're excited with the launch of the NYC care program in the Bronx and hungrily anticipate its expansion into the other boroughs with its added benefits such as quicker appointment availabilities and extended hotline and pharmacy hours. Essential services that our community has long advocated for. It is evident that the NYC care program is transforming in a direction that matches our community's current needs and it's precisely because of this reason that we support the funding for CBOs to conduct outreach efforts for NYC care. We ask that you ensure continued funding for CBOs involvement in this work and not just short-term funding. As you all know, CBOs are highly valued to our communities and play a vital role in program success. Furthermore, we support the addition of the FQHCs into the program. However, we want to enhance the program, not take away benefits from, from, not take away benefits from our communities. Lastly, to the council members here in NYC um, for taking care action to, su to support access to care for immigrant New Yorkers through both the essential plan expansion resolution and the NYC care bills. Thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, Miriam, please. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, council members Levine and Rivera for holding this hearing, and Corey, um, council speaker Corey Johnson. 
my name is Miriam Mohammed, and I'm the Government Relations Associate at Planned Parenthood of New York City. PPNYC is a trusted health provider of sexual and reproductive health services in New York City for over 100 years. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. PPNYC proudly supports Resolution 918, which calls on the enactment of a state-funded essential plan to allow access to all New Yorkers, regardless of immigration status. Presently, many New Yorkers are barred from obtaining public coverage through the New York State marketplace because of their immigration status, leaving over 400,000 individuals in the state with limited access to care. Expanded ac access through the essential plan could allow for an additional 100,000 individuals to enroll in affordable coverage. As a trusted health care provider, we witness the challenges and barriers immigrant New Yorkers face when accessing care. The percentage of foreign-born adults without insurance in New York has markedly decreased because of the Affordable Care Act. However, nearly half a million, um, nearly half a million are still uninsured. PPNYC also supports um, Intro 1668. Um, which will uh, allow the creation of a health access program um, and expand services in health and hospital facilities, nonprofit and private medical and providers, regardless of immigration status, in, un employment status, and pre existing conditions. We are thrilled to see the city council commit to um, creating medical homes for individuals um, who need care, regardless of their um, history with medical issues. Additionally, we strongly support the implementation of, pa of a patient navigation service through the Health Access Program. Implementing patient navigation services throughout New York City will provide a means to re receive the support, referrals, and the connections necessary to access care for our most disenfranchised individuals. Planned Parenthood is committed to ensuring that all individuals have access to high quality care and we strongly support the implementation of the Health Access Program that if imp implemented correctly will help secure access to primary health services. However, we do have questions about the implementation of the program, specifically about the structure of the medical home, the range of services that will be covered, and the requirements for participation in the health access program. These are outlined in our written testimony. Given the constant attacks from the federal government on immigrants, we must stand up to ensure all New Yorkers have access to quality care. We applaud, we applaud the City Council for protecting the rights of marginalized groups and safeguarding access to health care. Thank you. And Miriam, we will definitely review your written testimony. We know you have uh, a lot of good questions in there, and we thank you for posing them and for uh, speaking out today on behalf of PPNYC. Thank you. Thank you. Senor Juan. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, hello, my name is Juan Pinzon. I'm the Director of Health Services at the Community Service Society, and I would like to Thank Chairs uh, Levine and Rivera for the opportunity to provide these comments. I would like to center my comments on the Resolution 19, which supports uh, the Assembly and Senate bills uh, that are pending um, before the state leg leg legislature uh, that would allow all New Yorkers to enroll in the session plan, regardless of their uh, immigration based on income, but regardless of their immigration. Um, CSS health programs help uh, New Yorkers enroll into health insurance coverage and access the care they need. Uh, we do this through a live answer headline and a partnership with over 50 community-based organizations throughout the state. And we serve about 130,000 New Yorkers every year. Uh, CSS also conducts high-level policy research that supports the needs of our constituents. Specifically relevant to this resolution, CSS authored in 2016 a report that outlined the costs and feasibility of uh, offering the essential plan to New York's immigration populations. Since the implementation of the ACA, New York has successfully cut its insurance rate in half from 10% to 5%. And in fact, New York was one of just three states in the country that continued to uh, see a decrease in, in its rate of insurance according to the most recent census data uh, released last month. One of the single most important reasons for our success is the successful implementation of the essential plan under the ACA. Today, almost 800,000 New Yorkers have enrolled, uh, which is actually uh, nearly the entire eligible population. Unfortunately, both federal and state immigration restrictions limit coverage options for the roughly 200,000 uninsured unauthorized adult immigrants who reside in our state. The proposed le legislation would re re remedy this situation because it would offer a state-funded version of the essential plan for everyone who meets the income requirements regardless of the immigration status. There are three reasons why New York should take this landmark step. First, 
New York has been a historic leader in offering coverage to, to its immigrant residents without federal assistance. For example, it was the first state to offer comprehensive child health plus coverage to children regardless of their immigration status up to age 19. And most recently, New York City has expanded across, health, across uh, expanded access to health care for all uninsured New Yorkers, including all immigrants through the NYC care program. Second, evidence from the implementation of the ACA is proving that health insurance improves health and financial well-being of individuals and communities. Numerous studies indicate that people without coverage are more likely that their insurance counterparts to delay seeking preventive care and services for serious and chronic health condition. Recent research shows um, that access to coverage is associated with significant reductions in mortality and improvements in mental health, at least in part due to the higher continuity of care. And finally, lack of coverage for a significant portion of New Yorkers also causes problems for the broader healthcare system because it causes payers and providers to charge more to the insured population in order to offset the losses in providing care to the uninsured. In 2015, economists at the National Bureau of Economic Research attributed uncompensated care costs associated with the uninsured to be approximately $900 per person per year. For all these reasons, CSS encourages the New York City Council to pass this important resolution. Thank you again for, your, for the pro opportunity to, pro to provide these comments. Thank you so much, Juan. And if we could just create uh, space uh, for the mic, in front of the mic for, uh, sure. I believe next is Natalie, is that correct? Um, Can, before, Juan, can I ask you one question before? I, I know you're standing now, but in your testimony, uh, there is a note here that said in 2015 that there is the National Bureau of Economic Research attributed uncompensated care costs associated with the uninsured to be approximately $900 uh, per person per year, and that number has undoubtedly gone up since it's a 2015 number. So, you know, I, I, I asked Heldon Hospitals for this number, and I, I wanted to make sure as, as we're looking towards, you know, Community Service Society, you all are incredible in terms of, like, data and resources and all the tools that I've been using since I was in social services. Um, that number has undoubtedly gone up, and, and, I, and I, by your testimony, clearly you support the legislation, but the, that collaboration between FQHCs and H&H and &H, I think is so important. So I wanted to just point that out in your testimony and, and, and thank you, because uh, I think that that number has gone higher and it's really, really imperative that we're including the FQHCs in this expansion. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. C could I just add something quickly to that? I actually have a more updated number. Oh, okay. The Urban Institute did a study on the amount of uncompensated care that would be reduced by instituting an individual mandate. So the federal government has gotten rid of the, or has zeroed out the penalty for not having health insurance and states are contemplating what that would mean to institute it on a state level. And the estimate that they had is that it would actually be over $1,100 per uninsured person. So if you take the coverage for all bill into consideration, we think 110,000 people would enroll in insurance. That would reduce the state's uncompensated care burden by $130 million a year. Thank you. Wow. Okay, okay. please. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony in favor of intro 1668 and resolution 918, calling on the city and state to expand health coverage for New Yorkers who do not qualify for federal, federal programs. Um, thank you, Councilmember Levine, Councilmember Rivera. My name is Natalie Antoriano, and I'm from Care for the Homeless. CFH has 35 years of experience providing medical and mental health services exclusively, exclusively to people experiencing homelessness in New York City. Uh, we operate 20, 24 federally qualified and state licensed community health centers in Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, and Bronx. Our service sites are co-located facilities operated by other nonprofits that include shelters for single adults and families, assessment centers, soup kitchens, and drop-in centers. Additionally, our community-based health center model brings services directly to neighborhoods where the need is most significant. Both models reduce barriers homeless New Yorkers regularly face in navigating a complex healthcare system by increasing access to high quality care. All services are always provided regardless of an individual's ability to pay. We serve 7,100 patients and 46,000 visits annually. 85% of our clients at, are at or below 100% of the federal poverty limit. 63% receive Medicaid and 20% are uninsured. We have often testified about the need to provide appropriate medical and mental health care to New Yorkers experiencing homelessness. 
Appropriate medical care includes prevent preventative medicine, ongoing treatment, and specialty services, such as podiatry, optometry, and dentistry, which are vital to vulnerable and often underserved populations. But people don't often have easy or convenient access to essential services. Hindering opportunities to work, the ability to maintain healthy lives, and to obtain and keep permanent housing. We consider what we do a specialty because of how long it takes to gain the trust of our clients. Trust is something that we take very seriously, and in this climate, it is, it is imperative to not only increase access to medical services, but to provide access to the same high-quality services afforded to all New Yorkers. We applaud the city in its effort to introduce NYC care to communities most in need, and we are extra supportive of the initiative to include the vast network of community health centers located in the very communities where uninsured residents live. Community health centers like CFH have worked hard to gain the trust of the communities that we serve and are well equipped to carry out the NYC care mandate. Last year, we had a mother and a daughter come to our health center who had been using our services for many years. At the end of the visit, we tried making a referral to an active facility and the mother absolutely refused to go because she feared accessing any service outside of our facility would jeopardize her, st her status in the United States. This was a necessary referral that she decided to forego because she did not trust another, another health care provider. Stories like these are not uncommon and really speaks to the power that community health centers ha hold in providing the necessary services to address the health needs of a community. Even as medical care is legally more accessible, the fact is we must work harder to provide access to, access to vulnerable uh, populations that often fall or are excluded from the safety net. We want to thank you, thank both the health and hospitals committees and city council for your uh, outstanding commitment to increase access to health care for uninsured New Yorkers. We look forward to partnering with you while continuing our mandate to provide high quality, comprehensive primary care services to anyone seeking care, regardless of insurance coverage, income, or immigration status. Thank you. <laughs> so Thank good you. afternoon. Please. Yes. I am not Paloma. Paloma had a family emergency. So, so please excuse her. So I'll be saying her statement in summary. My name is Helen Arteaga. I'm the AVP of the Queens Network and Executive Initiatives of Urban Health Plan. So Urban Health Plan is a federally qualified health center that we serve about 90,000 individuals in Corona, Queens, South, the South Bronx, and Central Harlem. Over the last past 45 years, our organization has grown from one site to 29 practicing sites in our three boroughs. At Urban Health Plan, we take a great pride in providing true community-based health center and language health care. Um, in 2016 and 2017, Urban Health Plan, along with other FQACs, Health and Hospital, in a city-led effort called Action Health. This program was a multi-agency, year-long demonstration project led by the New York State Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. The aim was to increase access to health care for those who are uninsurable. Um, at first hand, we were able to see favorable results. We were able to see our patients in our cohort receive many preventive services, including hypertension, diabetes, weight control, cholesterol, tobacco use, access to depression, colorectal screenings, and HIV. And more important, all our patients got their flu shots. Just putting out there, it's flu season, take your flu shot. <laughs> our patients at Urban Health Plan in this program were linked with case managers that helped them navigate systems where they needed to get specialty care. Currently, we're working with Health and Hospital around New York City CARES, and we're seeing similar results. We hope to see access to quality care increase in a way, in a, in a way that is effective and systematic. This expansion is critically important in reducing health inequalities. The lack of money will no longer be, will no longer be a barrier, but it will be, on contrary, this program will help level the playing field for those enrolled in the program. Having such a large number of uninsured patients, federally qualified health centers are actually aware of the difference of how money can be a barrier to health care. Urban Health Plan and all the communities that we serve, we thank you for including FQACs in part of this program. And we look forward to working with health and hospitals, the city council, and the city of New York City to make sure that health care is not a right, is a right, <laughs> not a privilege. Thank you. So much. Have you had your flu shot? Yes, I did. Good answer. You were going to be in trouble <laughs> otherwise. Thank you to this excellent, excellent panel. It's going to be hard to top, but I think we can do it. Continuing the parade of healthcare leaders, we have Carlin Cowan from the Chinese American Planning Council. And, sorry, 
Michael Pereira from the Hispanic Federation, Mary Ford from Primary Care Development Corporation, also Patrick Kwan uh, from PCDC, Jessica Diamond from Hudson River Healthcare, as well as Hope Glassberg, also from Hudson River Healthcare. Welcome, and Carlin, do you want to kick us off? Absolutely. Good afternoon. My name is Carlin Cowan. I'm the Chief Policy and Public Affairs Officer of the Chinese American Planning Council, CPC. Thank you very much, Chair Levine, for the opportunity to testify today and for hosting this hearing. CPC is the nation's largest Asian American social services agency, providing services for over 60,000 New Yorkers in all five boroughs. Uh, for community members coming from 40 different countries and 25 different languages. We are pleased to testify today in support of uh, the intro to expand NYC CARES as well as the resolution in support of passing the essential plan, both of which we think are extremely important for our community members that we serve at CPC. Every year at CPC, we do an annual survey of the most urgent issues facing our staff and community members, and every year, Healthcare access tops the list for that survey. Fully one in four community members that walks through CPC's doors do not have access to health insurance. Overall, one in five Asian Americans lack access to health insurance entirely. These are community members that use the emergency room as their primary care if they use it at all. These are community members that do not have access to any of the public option programs and would be greatly served through the expansion of NYC CARES and the expansion of the essential plan. What this really means in human terms for the community members that CPC serves is that instead of providing the services that we really need to help our community members thrive, what CPC staff spend our time doing is pleading with our community members to go to the emergency room because we know they are so sick that they need care when they don't want to do it. We sit with our community members and help them decide if they should go to the doctor and refill their prescriptions or pay their rent that month or put food on the table. These are the real daily lived experiences of our community members because they cannot get the care that they need. In today's immigration climate, what we see is this is becoming even more of an urgent issue. While we had a victory with the public charge injunction recently, in a lot of ways the damage has already been done as community members are dropping off of their public programs and with the most recent health insurance proclamation, what we can see is what the federal administration is doing is beginning to use our health insurance programs as part of the deportation machine, and people's insurance status is being wielded against them to separate families. What this means is that New York City and New York State must take a strong stand to ensure that all community members, regardless of immigration status, regardless of ability to pay, have the health care that they need and programs like NYC CARES have been essential in doing this, and the essential plan being expanded to community members regardless of status would also be critical in this. While CPC is fighting for transformative health care programs like the New York Health Act and like Medicare for All that will help all of our community members get the care that they need and deserve, these programs are incredibly important as we fight for broader programs because they will meet the immediate needs of our community members that are in dire straits every day. Thank you so much for your support of these programs. Thank, thank you, Carlin. Can you remind me what neighborhoods your facilities are in? Our community centers are based in Manhattan, Chinatown, Flushing, and Sunset Park, although we have 33 different sites throughout the five boroughs. And how many, uh, how many uh, individuals do you see annually? We see 60,000 each year, 9,000 a day. That, that's, that's, a very, that's a very large number. Can you comment on the climate of, of the feelings now of, of the immigrants that you serve uh, with, with the attacks from the White House and elsewhere, and how that might impact their willingness to access um, uh, medical care? Absolutely. They have created just an incredible climate of fear. We saw people lined up outside of our doors after a public charge trying to de-enroll from health insurance. After the news of the health care proclamation came out, which would restrict access to people trying to enter the United States based on their ability to have health insurance, we had community members streaming into our centers saying, what's going to happen for this family member that I'm sponsoring, that I'm trying to petition to come with me? It is 
completely changing people's relationship to healthcare, which has already been difficult based on affordability, but now it's also based on immigration status as well. I mean, we certainly hear anecdotal stories of immigrants who are avoiding seeking medical care because they don't want to appear on the systems of any organization, and that should scare everybody. That should scare people who care about the welfare of immigrants, but um, you know, when it comes to public health, we're all in this together because many diseases are contagious, and um, I don't care who you are and what your ideology is or what your immigration status is, you should be really scared about a world where anyone in this city is refusing medical care. Um, and to the extent that organizations like CPC are on the ground, who are breaking down the trust barriers and bringing people in, uh, it, it's more important now probably than at any point uh, in the history of your organization. So thank you uh, to CBC and for your outspoken leadership, Carlin, on these issues. Thank, thank you. you. Please. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Pereira. I am the Health Outreach Coordinator at Hispanic Federation, the nation's premier Latino membership organization founded to address many inequities confronting Latinos and nonprofit organizations that work directly with them. For more than 25 years, the Hispanic Federation has provided grants, administered human services, and coordinated advocacy efforts for our board network of agencies. Collectively, the Federation serves more than 2 million Latinos in the area of health, immigration, economic empowerment, civic engagement, and education. Today, we are testifying on behalf of Hispanic Federation's health service providers and the Latinos Unidos Contra el SIDA LUCIS Coalition. Hispanic Federation's aid leaderships group comprised of 30 New York City agencies with long histories of services to diverse groups of Latinos. First and foremost, I would like to thank the New York City Council for welcoming us here today and listening to our testimony in support of the Council's resolution focusing on coverage for all's essential plan bill and the New York State Legislature. We applaud the New York City Council for calling on the Assembly members, state senators, and on the governor to pass and enact S3900 and A5974, which would expand eligibility for the essential plan to individuals who are currently face barriers to health and care coverage due to the immigration status. New York is often defined as a beacon for immigrants and should be leading the way in ensuring that every New Yorker has access to health care regardless of immigration status. Barriers to accessing health, care, health insurance is a public health concern that affects more than 400,000 New Yorkers. Those without health insurance often wait until they are in excruciating pain or at risk of dying to go to the emergency room just to receive care. Not only is this dangerous for the individual in its needs of services, but also comes at a monetary and societal cost to the larger community. Hispanic Federation believes that regardless of one's immigration status, whether you're a DACA recipient like 42,000 other New Yorkers or a TPS holder like some 33,600 New Yorkers, everyone should be able to see a primary physician on a regular basis for their health care needs. Health is not a luxury, it is a basic human right and necessity. Being insured has life saving implications. Not only is coverage for all a sound public health policy, but having health insurance means that our community will have access to primary care, physician, and preventative care. Um, it means that our neighborhoods will have access to annual physicals and regular checkups. It means symptoms will be reported when they are first noticed without fear of going into debt or worse, waiting until the pain is unbearable, visiting the emergency room, and finding out it's too late to, do, to have anything be done. Coverage for All is a mechanism for New York State to invest in healthier communities and better our entire society. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, and thank you to the Hispanic Federation for supporting this. Um, I just learned that the, there's another committee waiting to do a hearing in this room. Um, not to worry, everyone who signed up to speak will absolutely have that opportunity. We have two more panels, but unfortunately, we're going to have to start using the two-minute clock. I apologize. Um, we just want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to go on the record before we're kicked out of here. So please take it away. I will make the two minutes count. My name is Hope Glassberg. I'm the SVP of Government Affairs and Strategy at Hudson River Healthcare, which is a federally qualified health center network with 43 locations across the Hudson Valley, Long Island, and New York City. 
We were started in the mid-1970s uh, by four African-American mothers who created a community health center because they weren't able to travel up to two hours or more for care for their children. So that's really our rich legacy and history and continues today as we continue to support the notion that health care is very much a right and not a privilege. So with that, um, uh, we're very excited to be here today. In 2018, Hudson River Healthcare merged with Bright Point Health, which is a federally qualified health center network with sites in all five boroughs of New York City um, and an affiliation with the Community Health Action Network of Staten Island, um, where we provide a number of social services and supports. And my colleague, Sean Leahy, will tell you a little bit more about those services. As you have heard from um, a number of the other presenters, um, what makes the FQHC model unique and special is that we offer not only medical care, uh, but but uh, social supports, behavioral care, substance use disorder treatment, medication assisted treatment, the full gamut of social and health care needs in a single location so that we can meet our patients where, where they are. Um, and so another, another aspect of FQHCs that I want to highlight, because I think it's really important um, as, as the council considers this um, intro 1668, is that our governance structure is such that we have a majority of consumers on our board who are helping us make our decisions um, and direct the future of our organization. We also have community advisory boards in all of the communities where we exist that help us outreach to the community to share information not only about our health services, but also to dispel myths about public charge and other policies um, that unfortunately impede access to care. We've had a great dialogue thus far with the leadership of the New York City CARES program, as it is rolled out in the Bronx, where we do have some sites. And we're very hopeful that some of the steps that the program has taken to identify whether potential members are already connected to CARE um, when folks call into the uh, call center will be effective. But we believe that this initiative will help further strengthen the partnership between that program and existing FQHCs, particularly in communities where there may not be a health and hospitals facility. We think this is a matter not simply of just resources being made available to FQHCs to, to support a robust primary care network, but also an opportunity to engage in joint marketing and community education, leveraging those advisory boards and consumer leadership that I mentioned. Thank you so much for your consideration today, um, and we really appreciate the council holding this hearing today. Thank you, Hope. Uh, your, your, your punctuality is a model for council members everywhere. <laughs> And I didn't know that founding story about uh, Hudson Valley Healthcare. Yes. Hudson River Healthcare, excuse yeah. me. Uh, which is a perfect example of what I was speaking about, the origins of this movement, which really grew out of the civil rights era. Absolutely. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Please. Great. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before the committee today. I'm Mary Ford. I'm the Director of Evaluation and Analytics with the Primary Care Development Corporation. PCDC is a New York-based nonprofit organization and a U.S. Treasury um, certified community development financial institution that was formed as a public-private partnership by the City of New York, including the City Council. And we always have a um, council member serving on our board, which is currently um, Chair Mark Levine. Um, our mission is to create a healthier and more equitable um, communities by building, expanding, and strengthening primary care. Over the last 25 years, PCDC has provided capital and technical assistance to over 400 health care sites across the five boroughs. Um, we've also financed and enhanced health care facilities in 50 of the city council districts. Um, and this includes financing um, half of all FQHCs in New York City. Um, through capacity building programs, PCDC has trained and coached more than um, 9,000 health workers to deliver um, superior patient-centered care, including working with New York City Health and Hospitals, where we've um, provided technical assistance for ambulatory care redesign for over 15 years. And so what I'm here to talk about today is that since um, 2017, PCDC has received a generous discretionary award um, from the New York City Council that recently we've been using to examine primary care access across the city, specifically at the city council district level. This analysis is the first and only city council district level assessment um, of primary care access, and we're very thankful for the city council for the support. We found significant disparities and inequities in access to primary care in many of the council districts. Um, in particular, there were very stark differences in the ratio of primary care providers to constituents and residents. In some Manhattan districts, which is um, actually represented by uh, member Rivera, um, there were up to 64 primary care providers, whereas only two primary care providers per 10,000 um, 
residents in areas of um, Brooklyn and Queens. That means some council districts have more than 20 times the number of providers than in other um, districts. Um, and these districts with few primary care providers are often characterized by high poverty, unemployment, and higher rates of diabetes and potentially preventable emergency room um, visits. Um, of, of course, I think one thing just to emphasize with the primary care um, safety net is that our research does note that providers um, in higher poverty communities are more likely to accept Medicaid and Medicare and be patient-centered medical homes, which means that they are responding to many of the needs um, and are really critical in these neighborhoods. Um, I'd say in summary, literature does show that uh, more primary care providers in a community um, results in better outcomes. This definitely holds true in New York City, and we provided you all with some reports that are both district-specific and citywide on this today. Um, so strategic support and investment in primary care is essential to achieving health equity. And I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Patrick. To Thank you. Sure, hi, uh, my name is Patrick Kwan. I'm the Senior Director for Advocacy and Communications for uh, the PCDC. Um, so New Yorkers need hospital beds for when we are seriously sick and we need emergency rooms for emergencies. But what we also need is we need primary care services to help us stay healthy, maintain our health, and also avoid costly hospital stays and emergency room visits. Um, we were founded in 1993 by the Dinkins administration as a public-private partnership. At that time, the New York Times have, um, did a front page story about how uh, only 28 properly qualified doctors to serve a population of 1.7 million people in nine low income neighborhoods in Harlem, North Central Brooklyn, and South Bronx. And as we know, many of these disparities continue to persist. And while the, a lot of the infrastructure for the primary care has improved dramatically over 25 years, as we indicated in the primary care profiles, I also want to talk about that the New York's underserved communities need primary care services most, and relying on many of the folks here today um, who lack the resources to expand and improve services. And while the city council has made important and generous investments in community providers, these investments have not and will not meet the substantial capital needs. And um, we are speaking as a U.S. Treasury certified community development financial institution uh, with mission-driven expertise in finance and community-based health care. And one of the strategies that we hope the city council will consider um, is what we've been doing for the last 25 years across administrations um, to use a variety of capital instruments, including public and private loans, debt, and capital grants to enable more and larger uh, projects to meet uh, immediate and their substantial needs in the communities. And um, some of the recent financing that we've done in New York City for projects such as Apicha in Lower Manhattan, Callan Lord in downtown Brooklyn, the ICL um, for the East New York Health Hub and the Adabo Family Health Center in Rockaways have utilized federal new markets tax credits, New York State Community Health Care Revolving Capital Fund and private investments in addition to city council grants. Um, we look forward to working with city council on more comprehensive strategy to maximize the grant funds for financing primary care infrastructure expansion and and take advantage of some of the many resources out there, the capital instruments, to make sure that we have a comprehensive strategy utilizing the resources at every level to make some of these projects possible. Thank you. If I could just ask you a question, because you presented some, some data in terms of the stark differences, and clearly my community is, is better resourced, but for the 20 times more providers in some districts than others, what did you find were some of the major challenges. For the major challenges for? In terms of why there were so few primary care providers, do you think it's, it's uh, just that the wealth gap, was it geography? Like what are some of the things that we can try to do to overcome some of these immense challenges? Yep, so I think um, definitely the wealth gap would be one reason, but I do think in New York, it's a little bit unique just because of how dense uh, many areas are. The communities with the fewest um, primary care providers are areas in Queens, Central Brooklyn, that are really under-resourced across the board. Um, and so one of, again, the strategies that my colleague is um, recommending, and we of course are in support of it, PCDC, is really investing in um, more primary care. Um, so citing more facilities, expanding existing facilities, renovating, um, and renovating so that there are, again, more providers, more availability, and increased access 
um, in communities that don't have them um, currently, and then, um, and then um, yeah, working with existing organizations where there are, um, where there are PCPs to make sure that um, residents nearby are able to access them. And, and I just want to say, I, I know PCDC very well, and I don't think people realize how hard it is for community-based health centers to get financing. Uh, if you are a major hospital system with $7 billion in revenue, you're probably going to be able to do that all by yourself. But for these smaller nonprofits, they really do need um, an ally like PCDC. And that then translates just into more patients served and more neighborhoods. Um, and so your, your work is behind the scenes, but really, really important. And we're grateful for that. Please. Good afternoon. Stepping in for Jessica Diamond. My name is Sean Leahy. I'm also with Hudson River Healthcare. I want to tell you briefly about our New York City division, Bright Point Health. Um, Hudson River Healthcare, formerly known as Bright Point Health. So as Hope mentioned, we have locations in all five boroughs, uh, including the expansion of our new clinic and urgent care in East Brooklyn in January 2020. Some of our services cur currently include primary care, behavioral health, substance abuse treatment, and other specialty and social support services. I, like many of the others here, serve vulnerable populations in our city, many of which are homeless and uninsured. And Hudson River Health Care is in full support of Intro 1668, and thank you for your leadership to see this through. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to call the next panel, Wynn Periyasamy. And please let me know if I mispronounce her name. Andrea Bowen, Leon Bell, Let's see. Uh, Jabenga Awanusi, Anthony Feliciano, and Adele Flatasu. Flateau. Adele Flateau. Is this everyone? Uh, I think I'm missing someone. Yeah. Okay, you can begin. Andrea. Um, good afternoon, uh, Chair Rivera and um, Council staff. Um, <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Andrea Bowen. Um, I'm principal of Bowen Public Affairs Consulting, but today I'm here as also a, a coordinator of the Transgender, Gender Nonconforming, and Nonbinary, or TGNCMB Solutions Coalition, um, which is a coalition of various organizations, New York City Anti-Violence Project, uh, Make the Road, GMHC, uh, Trans Latin X Network, um, and Sylvia Rivera Law Project to meet the needs um, of TGNCMB New Yorkers. Um, thank you, and um, Chair Levine, uh, bill sponsors, uh, and staff on the committees in health and hospitals for um, your amazing advocacy, um, helping make possible um, the baselining of the LGBTQ community outreach workers program, and thank you for um, the bills that were introduced today. Um, so I'm just going to make a couple of quick points in a minute <laughs> um, that sort of relate to TGNC and the community and what's, what's at hand today. Um, with NYC CARE, it's of a par paramount importance to our coalition that the NYC CARE cover transition-related care, being care that's specific to the needs of the TGNC and B community. Um, we intend to work with H&H &H to outline which transition-related care treatments are covered by NYC CARE, 
we haven't started that project in earnest yet, but I just wanted to highlight it, and we're, we've started the conversation a couple months ago. Um, uh, with 1688, we support um, the effort to ensure a widespread and localized system of primary care provision. What we'd like to see is um, data collection on, we want to make sure that the patient navigators are referring people to population specific na navigators like the outreach work, LGBTQ community outreach workers, and that that data is tracked. And we provided some redlined data in our redlined language in this testimony that sort of explains that. Um, also regarding um, the res, um, we support that, um, and we just wanted to add a little bit of uh, red light language also that mentions that any essential plan needs to cover transition-related care, which is already the law in New York, but still worth, worth noting. So um, <laughs> thank you very much for your time, uh, and if you have any questions about my testimony. And I just want to let you know, we're going to make sure that your testimony is on the record and we realize two minutes is not a lot of time. So but just know your testimony will all be read into the record and we do appreciate you kind of like summer, summarizing it. Thank you. Mr. Bell. Uh, I'd like to thank the committee. My name is Leon Bell. I'm from the New York State Nurses. I'm going to be very brief. I just want to make a couple points. Obviously, we support <clears throat> intro 1668, resolution 198. Um, I would add that as a, a further step in the process, I think it's important for the, the council to um, consider e expanding um, the scope of the, um, the uh, New York City care program um, by forcing, coaxing, or shaming the private hospital systems to pick up their share. And I think that would address a lot of the questions that were raised about the costs of um, adding the services unnecessary to meet the population needs. Um, I would also just like to point out that um, our, our data, and it's pretty readily available on the State Department of Health website, shows that Medicaid enrollments are down uh, between March of 2018 when the Trump administration unveiled its um, new public charge uh, planning. Um, and through October that the Medicaid enrollments are down about 150,000. I don't believe that's a function of the Trump uh, economy or economic boom. Um, I think it's a function of people being afraid to sign up um, and uh, take benefits that they're otherwise entitled to. Uh, because we haven't seen any real expansion of other enrollments and other programs that would sort of indicate that people are switching out of Medicaid and into other, other coverage. Um, and I think what that gets to when we talk about New York City care, and one of the things um, HHC was here for a long time, they seem to have left, but um, I would recommend that the council and HHC, or health and hospitals, um, look at the issue of the hoops or the steps that are required for people to enroll in the new program and that they should seriously consider making it a much simpler process where people just come in and say, I'm uninsured and I'm a New York City resident and they should be enrolling people without requiring a lot of documentation because I think that's one of the issues at, at play with the um, reduction in Medicaid services. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Anthony Feliciano. I'm the director of the Commission on the Public Health System. I'm not going to go through my whole testimony, but I'll say here we are a major supporter of not only NYC CARES program, but we also support both resolutions and bills on the strengthening and enhancing it for more communities. Uh, I just want to remind us to, that there are two major things that impact success right now for this and, and any program around. One, we still have uncompensated care in the indigenous care pool not properly uh, distributed to, to real safety net hospitals. So that imp makes an impact in terms of programs like this. And then the other is what uh, Leon had mentioned around the, um, the dip in the Medicaid enrollment and the, real, and the main reasons really coming from fears of this federal administration onslaught on our communities, particularly immigrant communities and all marginalized communities. Um, so that's a, 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 even though it's not into law the public charge, it, it did its intended consequence, what it wanted to do. The administration wanted to put the fear in, in immigrant communities and make them disenroll and not come into um, hospitals or any healthcare system um, location. I, I want to put in recommendations. Supporting stakeholder engagement. h, &H has done good with working with CBOs, culturally complex CBOs to enhance and work with NYC CARES program, but I still think many of our partners have said that is not enough. Uh, the investment into the CBOs didn't cover what they can do, and there was a lot of work to do with it, even though they succeeded in doing it. 
but it really needs to look at the smaller CBOs and how you, what's the funding like for them to continue doing this. The other part is obviously we think you strengthen any rollout by bringing in the FQACs and the primary care providers um, because they're overall important part of the safety net. And so we wanna make sure that um, that's a really addressed and that's why we support the resolution of the bill, but we also think that the funding is not enough. Uh, I'm gonna be very political on this. The mayor used this as his campaign slogan in running for the president. That has to go beyond that, and we have to really invest in you care about communities and invest in the FQAC being equal partners there. And I would just add that in, in terms of ensuring evaluation of the program, in terms of the call center and all that, and the third piece I think we haven't touched on. We all hear constantly because we have not really designed and worked in creating real community health planning. We lack that in this city, in this state. And part of that is also not addressing the inequity of how private hospitals and other entities have taken advantage of our safety net in terms of who they serve, particularly the most underserved. So thank you. Hi there, my name is Wynne Perry Asami. I am a fellow with Physicians for National Health Programs, New York Metro chapter, and I'm also a law student at Fordham. Um, so in my current work, I work with both med students and doctors fighting for guaranteed health care statewide and nationally. Our students and providers work in public hospitals as well as community health centers alike with, and with immigrant patients, both with and without status. Um, our students have spoken of learning in clinics and in class ways to navigate getting, he getting health care for their patients who are uninsured or underinsured. This is a part of what they're learning every day as they're trying to learn how to become doctors as well, and that's just not right. Um, many patients, uh, many of these patients are undocumented. All of this is frustrating, and PNHP New York Metro wants to see more for immigrant patients. While we are fighting primarily for guaranteed health care through the New York Health Act and uh, through state well, national single payer, um, we support our coverage for all colleagues and support the essential plan bill on the state level. Guaranteed immigrant health access is cost effective and it's humane. We stand with coverage for all as we fight for guaranteed health care statewide. Health care should be a human right and a human norm, no matter your, insur uh, your insurance status, immigration status, income, no matter what. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Chairman Levine and Council Members. My name is Adele Flatto, and I'm here to testify on behalf of the Alliance for Healthy Communities North and Central Brooklyn. The Alliance is a partnership of three federally qualified health centers in Brooklyn, which are also members of Chicanies. The three centers, and, the three centers include Bedford-Stuyvesant Family Health Center, Brooklyn Plaza Medical Center, and Brownsville Multiservice Family Health and Wellness Centers. By way of background, I have 30 years of experience working directly in healthcare as an executive as well as being a community advocate. I've held se senior level positions in the private sector as well as in the public sector for NYC Health Plus Hospitals from which I am now happily retired. <laughs> um, according to data provided by the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, community health profiles, the Alliance Health Centers are facing some of the most drastic health outcomes, mortality rates, and disparities in New York City. In Brownsville Community District 16, 13.3% of women have late or no prenatal care, double the 6.7% rate for New York City overall. In all of our districts, childhood asthma emergency room visits exceed New York City overall with extremely high rates for Bedford-Stuyvesant and Brownsville. Childhood obesity rates in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brownsville, and East New York exceed New York City overall. This means that more than one out of every five children in grades eight, K through eight are considered obese. Premature death rates before age 65 summarize the health inequities facing our communities. The rate of premature death per 100,000 population is 169 for New York City overall, while it is 178.5. 178.7 for CD2, 283 for CD3, 264 for CD5, and an astounding premature death rate of 365 for Brownsville, more than double New York City's rate. Just gonna to skip to the end, sorry. Oops.
We urge the New York City Council and administration to develop and implement a health access program which will be integrated with the vital safety net services of FQHCs. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today on behalf of the Alliance for Healthy Communities North and Central Brooklyn. Thank you very, very much. I hear it was an excellent panel, so I'm told. I'm going to have to review the videotape later. <laughs> I, I have no doubt. Um, thank you very, very much for supporting this legislation. And I want to add that Health and Hospitals and the Department of Health, they are still here and they are still listening, so thank you. Okay. Well, we decided to save the best panel for last. No pressure. Um, Mia Solto from the New York, from NILPI, New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. Domna Antoniadis from New York Legal Assistance Group, NILAG. Hope I said that right. Brian Fuss from, sorry, having a hard time reading the organization, but. Tasfia Rahman from the Coalition of Asian American Children and Families. Manyak Yu from the Academy of Medicine. And finally, Nicole White. Good afternoon, my name is Mia Soto. I'm the community organizer at the New York Lawyers of the Public Interest at the Health Justice Program. Um, thank you to the Chairperson Levine and the community members uh, for giving the opportunity to present testimony today. Uh, for the past 40 years, New York Lawyers of the Public Interest has been leading civil rights and legal services advocate for New Yorkers marginalized by race, poverty, disability, and immigration status. Our health justice program brings a racial justice and immigrant rights focus to healthcare advocacy in New York City and state. In partnership with community-based organizations and coalitions, we work to advance our four broad goals, which were, which are challenge health disparities, eliminate racial and ethnic um, discrimination and system systematic and institutional barriers and limit universal access to health care, uh, promote immigrant and language access to health care, and address the social determinants of health. Uh, NILP is also here as a member of Coverage for All campaign, uh, a campaign to expand coverage for all New Yorkers, led by a coalition of community members, community-based organizations, health care providers, legal service providers, and advocates from labor, immigrant, and health care consumer, consumer advocates. Our our objective is to create a statewide health insurance product for New Yorkers who are excluded from eligibility for coverage because of harmful, shameful disparities and inequalities based on race, ethnicity, nationality, language, gender identity, and other factors. We firmly believe that all New Yorkers have the right to access the care they need in their communities, and we sincerely hope that the council will prioritize immigrant communities, and particularly immigrant health, by allocating the funding necessary to create a state-funded plan for all New Yorkers. Um, right now, there are more than 400 New Yorkers who cannot enroll in health insurance because of health, because of health insurance discrimination, exposing them to further risk of illness and injury. NOPI has been advocating for equity and health justice for New Yorkers marginalized by race and immigration status for decades. Um, and to this end, we urge the council in the city of New York to take action to support access to, ca to care for immigrant New Yorkers. Um, lastly, I want to personally thank the members of the council and the efforts made by the city of New York for all your actions and support uh, for us and our vulnerable populations in the city. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks to NILPI. What you do in your healthcare access program is just so important, more than ever. And um, I'm really glad the city council can help support that effort. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Uh, I'll be trying to summarize this. Thank you. My name is Domna Antoniadis, and I am a senior staff attorney at the Legal Health Division of the New York Legal Assistance Group. We are in support of Resolution 918. Legal Health is the nation's largest medical legal partnership with legal clinics at 36 New York City health facilities. 
Healthcare providers routinely refer undocumented patients to our on-site clinics because in many situations, without insurance, the medical team cannot treat the patient following normal standards of care. My testimony will focus on undocumented access to life-saving treatment. Over the past five years at the Bellevue Cancer Center, I have worked with over 225 undocumented cancer patients whose doctors could not provide life-saving or life-improving treatment because of their status. In this same time period, Legal Health has worked with over 1,750 patients in a similar position. Many of Legal Health's and most of my clients die, in part because of the time realities of legal advocacy and navigating bureaucratic red tape. A premature death can mean economic instability for a family who relied on the decedent to support them and shifting the burden to the larger community. For example, Lewis, a 34-year-old father to four children, was diagnosed with acute leukemia where the standard of care is a stem cell transplant. After months of intense advocacy, we were able to get him insured, but unfortunately he relapsed. His family ultimately had to apply for public assistance because they had no other way of getting by. Cases like this have a profound impact on healthcare providers. A study found that providing undocumented patients with suboptimal care because of their immigration status contributes to professional burnout and moral distress. Many of the oncologists I work with reference their experience with undocumented patients as one of the reasons why they are leaving the public health system. As one doctor told me, I love that at Bellevue I can truly practice medicine, but what's the point if I can't even treat some of my patients? While Bellevue may be the largest safety net hospital in New York City, we have seen similar frustrations and feelings of helplessness across all medical disciplines in both public and private hospitals. Ultimately, a transplant for Lewis and those like him is more cost effective than continuing futile chemotherapy and end of life care. Cost benefit studies comparing, for example, stem cell transplants versus chemo, kidney transplants versus dialysis, consistently show major direct medical savings as well as adjusted quality of life. Just to finish up, additionally, there's a missed opportunity by denying these patients access to clinical trials, which impacts health innovation and quality care for the rest of the population. For two patients that we've worked with, Miguel, who was diagnosed with stage four melanoma and participated in a groundbreaking trial on immunotherapy trial. Immunotherapy for the treatment of previously untreatable melanoma is now in remission, despite initially being only given a month to live. For others, like Vivian, she's the only woman of color currently enrolled in a National Institute of Health trial comparing different forms of stem cell sources for those who cannot find donor matches. These are the exceptions. They were able to participate in these trials and receive these treatments because they were fortunate enough to have a team of doctors and lawyers working together for months. Many patients do not have that luxury or the time to wait. This proposed resolution will help minimize the health inequalities faced by our immigrant population. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are keeping the crowds at bay as long as we can. And you're going to close us out. Um, good afternoon. My name is Tasfia Rahman, and I'm a policy coordinator at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. Um, I want to thank you, Councilmember Rivera and Councilmember Levine, for holding this um, important hearing today. Um, since 1986, CACF is the nation's only Pan-Asian Children and Families Advocacy Organization and leads the fight for improved and equitable policies, systems, funding, and services to support those in need. The Asian Pacific American APA population is over 1.3 million pe people, a very rapidly growing community, yet the needs are consistently overlooked, misunderstood, and uncounted. Also, as a New York State patient navigator contractor that works with eight other APA-serving and led organizations, we are too aware of the challenges APA families and individuals face in accessing adequate health coverage and care. Disparities in health access and care are especially compounded in our community by poverty, immigration status-related challenges, language barriers, cultural stigmas regarding public benefits, and low utilization of primary and preventive care. Consider, almost 15% of Asian Americans ages 18 and over remain uninsured in New York City. A majority, almost 90% of Asian Americans uninsured are foreign born. 21% um, of APAs are considered underinsured, meaning the insurance coverage that they have is inadequate. Um, because of the pressing need to ensure better coverage and care um, for, our, for our immigrant community, we support the adoption of the two legislation. 
um, introduction, um, intro 1668 because NYC CARE needs to be fully resourced to support the work necessary to ensure that everyone, especially the most marginalized and vulnerable communities, have access to quality health care and coverage. We also advocate for strong partnerships with local community-based organizations, particularly in the APA community, to ensure that immigrant communities are being reached and increase their access. Finally, we do support Resolution 0918 um, because of the expansion of health insurance coverage to include those who are ineligible because of their immigration status. Considering that APA families and individuals face high rates of uninsurance and underinsurance on our heavily immigrant, this expansion is crucial to improving their overall health and well-being. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We have had uh, 35 people testify, and by my tally, we've had 35 people who support this legislation, and uh, let me just run the numbers here. Zero against. Um, what a fabulous, fabulous hearing this has been, and I think it pushed us forward towards our goal of ensuring that every single person in this city regardless of where they live or what their immigration status is, has access to primary care. And Chair Rivera, it has been a pleasure, as always, to uh, lead this with you. And that concludes the hearing. Thank you.